Okay, so welcome to CE50. Welcome, Robin, in Toronto. So the irony, of course, of the name Canadian Electronic Ensemble is that the group's four founding members were all Americans, not Canadians. Uh, it seems fit then that CE50 joins us across the Canadian US border. And of course, welcome to anybody who's joining um, beyond those two countries. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that for many in CMU and Pittsburgh communities and around the globe today is not a day of celebration. My thoughts specifically turn to Thailand, Iran, Ukraine, and so many other places, and also many tragedies and struggles here in the United States and in Canada. This weekend is also Canadian Thanksgiving. For those of you who are based in Canada or who like me were raised in Canada, Take time this weekend to research which treaty territory you live on. Learn about the responsibilities you have within that treaty. If where you live doesn't have, you know, um, treaties that uh, have signed and, and spell out your responsibilities, then figure out whose land you are on. Listen to the leaders of those communities. Learn and support. Monday is Indigenous Peoples Day here in um, the United States. Find your local indigenous nations and organizations. Here in Pittsburgh, we have the Three Rivers American Indian Center. Unlearn harmful myths and Eurocentric narratives about indigenous peoples and settler occupation of indigenous lands. Many of us belong to institutions such as CMU that hold immense privilege. Use that privilege to provide material benefits to the indigenous communities where you are. With today's symposium on the CEE and electronic music, I make the following commitments as a school of music faculty member and a member of the electronic music division. The electronic music division will build community with Pittsburgh electronic musicians and sound artists. That the electronic music division will remove barriers to studying at CMU so that it is not a privileged and accessible space in which Pittsburgh black and indigenous youth and other youth of color are excluded. That our technology focused work will remember the carbon footprint of our work and we will actively contribute to environmental justice work in our region. And to this end, I commit to supporting the work of the Seneca Nation of Indians, whose land we occupy here in Pittsburgh. The Seneca Nation of Indians does essential work in protecting the Allegheny watershed. And they invite us to partner in that work. I encourage you to brainstorm ways in which you can learn and unlearn and materially contribute to the social justice and decolonial work in your region. 50 years is a remarkable achievement. It's a testament to the dedication of these musicians to electronic technologies, live performance, composition, improvisation, and collaboration. It's also a reflection of the CEE's thoughtful curation of members and collaborators. It's also, whoops, um, just one second. It's also a reflection of the CE's thoughtful curation of members and collaborators, fostering relationships that could be happily sustained over the decades. So we celebrate 50 years, but we also celebrate so many other impressive anniversaries within those 50 years, 26 years since Paul Stillwell first performed with the CEE. 25 years since Rose Bolton first composed for the CEE, and then she joined in 1999, Though Rose is on hiatus from the group while she focuses on her composing and teaching. 15 years since John Camille Farah first performed as a guest with the CEE. He is also uh, busy with solo performances right now in Germany and Europe, so he's not joining us today. And five years since David Sutherland officially joined the CEE. I just want us to take in um, the beauty of some of these pictures, we've got 1972, 1998, I believe, 2013, and then photos probably from 2018 or so. Another important anniversary is 15 years, 15 years since I met the Jaegers. I moved to Toronto in September 2007 to begin my PhD at the University of Toronto. I lived with David and Sally Jaegers' daughter, Anna, during my first year. David and Sally lived only a 25-minute walk down Broadview Avenue. So they welcomed me for meals and teas during that year and the subsequent year of my studies. The subsequent years, there's many years. During these last 15 years, I have watched CE performances, attended rehearsals with their gracious permission, interviewed them multiple times, listened over and over to past albums and combed through Jim's meticulous records of performance history. 
Today's gathering will give you only a small window into the CEE's activities over the last 50 years. And I hope you are inspired to dig deeper into the CEE and other exciting electronic music here in Pittsburgh, in Toronto, and from wherever you are joining us. Despite the CEE's long history and substantial discography, the group has received little scholarly attention. Not only has there been no in-depth study of the CEE, but they have been almost entirely left out of articles, chapters, and books about electronic music history and live electronic ensembles when those forces, sources tend to focus on European and US ensembles. I am proud to announce that I'm publishing the first book on the Canadian Electronic Ensemble with McGill Queens University Press, forthcoming in 2023. And there is the super fun uh, cover design. This is the public reveal of the cover. Uh, this morning, I offer only a brief overview of the CEE. But grab a copy with, coffee with me. I'm happy to talk your head off. Um, and also, of course, talk to the CEE themselves. They're very generous with stories. David Grimes, David Yeager, Larry Lake, and James Montgomery, Jim Mudfish, his amazing hair, did not know one another before arriving at the University of Toronto. Yet like many graduate cohorts, they bonded quickly. Late night sessions at the University of Toronto Electronic Music Studio sealed their lifelong friendship and creative collaboration. The quartet officially became the electronic, Canadian Electronic Ensemble in 1972. The next 14 years were immensely productive especially considering that each member maintained full-time employment outside of the CEE. The four founding members of the CEE were united in the goal of not only composing electronic music, but also performing it live as both predetermined or what we might call composed and improvised works. Beyond the consideration of performance, the CEE has always been an outlet for both individual and collective compositional creativity. The idea of gathering an audience to listen to music in a concert hall without live performers on stage was relatively new and for some alienating. While these young composers did not dislike hearing music from loudspeakers and certainly composed a number of fixed works themselves as students and in, in, in their professional careers um, since then, they were ultimately musicians. They wanted to perform music. For electronic music, this required an entirely new array of equipment. In order to translate studio work to live performance, the CEE built some of their own equipment or repurposed pre-existing equipment. Montgomery explained to Norman Beecroft, quote, we devised our own instruments at first using some of the equipment we uh, found in, which was found in normal synthesizers, some of which wasn't. The dream of live electronic music performance was achieved in large part at that time due, due to the AEMS um, Synthi A a compact synthesizer that was released in 1971. During the 14 years that the original quartet was together, the CEE composed prolifically, both as individuals and as a group, commissioned new works, collaborated with numerous non-electronic musicians, and established the aesthetic performance practice and close friendship that has allowed the CEE to thrive. Um, one of the most frequently performed uh, pieces during that era was piano quintet number five, which was uh, a group composition. It's included on the group's first LP from 1977, a self-titled LP, recorded here with Karen Kieser, Lake's wife, and a frequent um, CEE collaborator. Piano quintet is a highly dramatic work. The middle section in particular exploits the piano's capacity for cacophony an effect that is exaggerated by the live piano processing and synthesizer accompaniment. Um, and I definitely want to take time uh, in this introductory, introductory session to play some of their music so we have it lingering in our ears even as we um, are listening to more formal presentations. Okay, so I'm going to play. a bit of piano quintet.
I'm going to skip ahead to that middle part where I mentioned uh, cacophony. <laughs> The Canadian Electronic Ensemble was officially a trio from 1986 until late in 1996. The group, it, this is a group that knows how to mobilize like-minded musicians. During the 1970s and 80s, this was achieved primarily through collaborations with solo artists. But while the CEE was a trio during much of the 80s and 90s, they frequently performed with other musicians, including uh, large ensembles, many of which they formed and hosted themselves. On May 24th, 1992, CE presented Mega Jam, a concert of live improvisation featuring 18 electronic musicians for a concert of live improvisation, which was later released as an album in 2000. I would argue that the most important aspect of the CEE's trio era was the multi-year relationship with improvisational group Trio Collective. Performances in 1989 were then followed up by performances together in Toronto and Kingston, in 1992, tours in Europe, in Quebec and Europe, a three-week residency at the BAMP Center for the Arts under the name Super Trio, workshops at the inner, for Inner City Angels in Toronto, and an album titled Super Trio. Here is an excerpt from Instrumental De from that album. The CEE remained a trio until Michael Dobinson and Paul Stilwell joined in 96. Laura Wilcox joined, but was shortly thereafter replaced by Rose Bolton. Dobinson left the group in 2005. I, I call this the quintet sex trip, quintet era. Uh, this era of the CEE was relatively unstable in comparison to the previous two and a half decades. The 2000s in particular were a time of transition and preoccupation with non-CEE activities for many of the members. With an ensemble as long-standing as the CEE, it seems reasonable that such periods of flux and lulls in activity would occur. Otherwise, the entire group would burn out and abandon the endeavor altogether. The CEE has never been a full-time job for its performers, so other demands have always competed for its members' time and focus. Here, I'm gonna show a video clip. Um, this is a 2012 performance. And so while technically John Camille Farah had joined, he's not performing in this performance. And so it does give you an idea of what um, the group was like as a quintet in the 2000s. Um, they're performing a composition entitled No Dim Pearls by John S. Gray. Uh, for this time in their, in their activities, it's really rare that they're performing a composition by a non 
CEE member. This was a friend who had, had composed for them previously. In the video, we see that they're set up on a long table facing out to the audience. Montgomery, who's standing at the moment, is at the left with Jaeger, Lake, Stilwell, and Bolton. Both Lake and Bolton are playing acoustic instruments, trumpet, and violin um, with and without live poses name. John joined the CEE in the late 2000s and David Sutherland or Suds in 2017. The vast majority of the material the CEE now performs is free group improvisations, as opposed to collectively or individually composed works with titles and notated frameworks. I won't say too much about what the CEE is up to now because in session two, you're gonna hear about their recent Pass the Track project. After 50 years of electronic music making history, the story of the CE still focuses on relationships and the members' memories of first encounters and shared experiences. The group's compatibility as both sound makers and social humans has been key to their longevity and desire to continue their work together. Their respect for each other's activities outside of the CE has also been essential. The draw of electronic sound worlds has sent them in a wide ranging search for influences and deep studies of their instruments. After decades of electronic music making, the CEE remains excited to explore and experiment through collective discovery. In Canada, there is no group like the CEE. With its decades at the forefront of electronic music making, they have witnessed and helped construct the development of electronic and experimental music making across the country. In the broader world of electronic music making, the CEE distinguishes itself by its longevity, by its balance of the individual and the collective, of composed and improvised sounds, and by its Canadianness, I would suggest. On the global stage, the CEE's Canadianness is most apparent through its relationship with Canadian arts and media organizations, such as the University of Toronto, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and the Canadian Music Centre. The CEE has also been deeply influenced by key Canadian creative voices, such as Armory Schaefer, Hildegard Westerkamp, and Glenn Gould, each of whom has shaped how the ensemble and its members relate to sound, performance, listening, and recording. This is the first uh, event that has some sort of in-person element that I've hosted since February 2020. And that happened to also be about the CE. They visited here CMU for a week, and it was a flurry of workshops, rehearsals, and performances for the CE CMU and Pittsburgh communities. And I'm so excited that CMU can host once again the CEE albeit uh, remotely this time. Thank you, CEE, for joining us from Toronto to celebrate this tremendous accomplishment. Many of today's sessions and presentations are focused on the CEE's activities and context. Many others take the CEE's innovation of collaborative live electronic music to other contexts, including a panel after lunch on Pittsburgh's electronic music communities. This day is both about the CE, CEE, and it's about electronic music. Whatever topic brought you here, welcome. 
We're glad you joined us and we look forward to a wonderful day of presentations and conversations. when we wanted to start this, uh, the, the day, CE50, I thought of no one better than Norma B. Croft to set the scene. Um, those of you who don't know Norma B. Croft, you better go and Google her after this because she has done everything. Composer, producer, broadcaster, administrator. She co-founded the new music concerts. She produced... Um, many, many albums of electronic music. She was experimental uh, in her own electronic music. And she also wrote, uh, well, she, she published a really great book um, called Conversations with Electronic Music Pioneers, in which she had interviewed basically everybody, <laughs> every, every name that you can think of in electronic music globally uh, in the kind of the mid, the mid 20th century. Um, so she's really quite remarkable, and hopefully she can come and share her experiences. But even if she's not, Matthew and I will will talk uh, about about it as much as possible. I'm so happy that Matthew is here to join yeah, us. Uh... I met Matthew at the, the Canadian Music Center, where he was director of the Ontario region, and just just um, you know led so many important initiatives. And it was just such a pleasure to work with you, Matthew. And then now you're executive director at the Transac, which is my favorite Toronto oh. venue. So I'm so glad that you are heading up that space. And I'm really excited to see how it can thrive in the coming years, because I know performance spaces have had a rough time in the last few years. So um, until Norma possibly shows up, uh, Matthew and I are going to have a conversation uh, just from remarking on so many of the amazing things that she has done. Matthew can speak firsthand, um, witnessing her administration of, of new music, including new music concerts, but also you were vital in the, publica in the publication of the ebook. Um, right. It's subsequently been published as uh, the printed book here. Yes, the printed book is right there. <laughs> So maybe I'll turn it over to you, Matthew, if you just have some introductory or overarching uh, comments about Norma and what sure. you've seen her do. Yeah, and I'll just mention to folks that, uh, as, as Alexa mentioned, I, I work at the Transact Club. Um, when I logged on to Zoom, I realized it was in the Transact Club account, which is why I'm identified as that, and I can't seem to rename myself. But yeah, my name is Matthew Fava. I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks, Alexa, for organizing this and for the invitation. Uh, it's a real delight to be participating. And I'll, I'll mention to folks that I came to the Canadian Music Centre after spending a bit of time in <clears throat> campus-based community radio. So having some experience in broadcasting, in journalism, in documentary production, in this very homespun way, but but really importantly, my experience in radio came from a lot of curiosity, seeking out mentorship, seeking out colleagues who were able to give me instruction, who allowed me to look over their shoulder in a studio setting uh, or look over their shoulder uh, when they were actually just conceiving of scripting, researching uh, for the purpose of broadcasting. And when eventually, I met Norma, this was after I learned about her music, learned and listened to samples of her, her recordings. Um, I was really struck by her own capacity to just kind of seek out through her own curiosity, various friends and colleagues who she would learn from and, and also the fact that that continued throughout her life. And this was one of the things I was really excited to speak with her about because I get the sense that you know, she's someone who was always able to ask for support, ask questions and learn from her colleagues. And I, I really wanted to hear, and I think we'll get a sense of that when she joins or perhaps even from the CEE members, just around that connection that they had um, and how they were able to learn from one another or support one another uh, for decades. And, and one of the other things that I think uh, I'll speak to upfront about Norma. Well, there are a handful of things. One of the things that I think is really significant about the New Music Concerts Initiative, which began just over 50 years ago. So again, just preceding the uh, start of the CEE, is that it was a training ground for so many of the artists in this city. It was, you know, this 
particular game for the kind of artistic development, the cultivation of numerous performers, the capacities, uh, the competencies, the fluencies of those performers, likewise audiences, but I was going to Again, this is one of the themes I was going to be curious to ask Norma about, but uh, but I, I think it's significant the role that she played not only in fostering this kind of professional platform, uh, this platform that also was driving artistic dialogue in the city and in the region, uh, but that also, and, and I don't know if she was going to speak to this if I asked her, but I, I'm also constantly admiring of the fact that she also had capacity to host people in a more private way, and I think that's one of the interesting things about Toronto is that there is this kind of professional aspect of the arts community, but yeah, of course, like so many places, there's also this more private social atmosphere, and she was really cultivating that as well. I don't know that we give folks like Norma credit for that, for hosting parties constantly to accompany concerts, and so at the same time that New Music Concerts was this conduit for countless performers, countless composers visiting the city, uh, that there was this atmosphere that was created beyond that, that again, extended the artistic dialogue in ways that I don't know that we can properly quantify, but that when you speak to people in Toronto about those days, a lot of people remember the parties, uh, the opportunities after the events. And I, I always impressed by Norma's capacity on the one hand to be this you know, intensive administrator helping to wield these artistic forces, but then also to just host the community. That's something that, you know, as an administrator, I never had capacity for that. If ever I was doing some kind of joint initiative, I was always leaning on people with that um, more ostentatious, uh, more sociable capacity that I usually, you know, it would diminish very quickly for me. So I, I really admire Norma's kind of technical and creative capacities and then these other nurturing capacities that uh, she drew upon that I, I think helped to define the scene in Toronto for a lot of people. And, you know, maybe in a few minutes, we can welcome um, David Yeager and Jim Montgomery yeah. into this conversation, and they can um, speak firsthand of what, you know, what they were witnessing from um, Norma's leadership and, and guidance and mentorship in these kind of more overt, and then these more um, subtle ways, as you say, social. Yeah. So it certainly resonates for me, given also how important relationships are to the oh, city, yeah. those friendships and the in the gathering and uh you know and and they'll always say and like the good bottle of whiskey uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's that it's it was always both it was yeah. always yeah let's let's rehearse let's practice let's create something let's do a concert you know let's let's produce yeah. a big thing but then let's also hang out and and also as much as possible um use a platform to showcase other musicians and, yeah. and things like that um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the the book. Sure. I, I I found with the book, you know, that first of all, it took forever for Norma to actually do this, even though she had these amazing interviews. You know? Yeah. And then also that I feel like she doesn't, of course, of course she doesn't. If you know Norma, she would never do this. But like she she really, um, you don't realize like how tremendous she is when, when reading this reading this book. She's quite she understated. Talk about her yeah. Own activities. Yeah. Uh, she's oh, you know she's really using it again as a way to point to others. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the book, sure. and the process, and all that. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll try to drop a few links in. Just one of the links I dropped in right now is just to one of the new music concert programs from 1972-73. So we're kind of approaching the 50th anniversary of when the CEE was part of a multi-space performance with Nexus and David Rosenboom, or at least I think an ensemble of David Rosenboom's uh, as part of new music concerts. And so um, I, I just kind of dropped that in there because maybe I'll hint at it a little bit later. But, but the book... Um, when I first met Norma at the Canadian Music Centre in the early 2010s, uh, we just had these kind of casual interactions, chatted about her gardening. Uh, she took part in an interview initiative that we started called Generations Conversations, wherein we would have these younger artists and composers speaking to some of the elders in the new music community, Norma among them. And after that, she started hinting at this thing, uh, this thing that she had, this kind of treasure she was sitting on, which were all of these recordings, uh, extensive recordings, you know, deep conversations with uh, various folks who were at the forefront advancing electronic music uh, in a few different geographical spaces, institutional spaces. And 
she had this optimism around having it published and asking advice. And I, I didn't have so many contacts in the world of publishing. I had some friends in magazine publishing. I had some friends who had uh, crossed over and been able to get print books public, published. Uh, so I was kind of a mild resource until we got to the point in 2014 where Norma and I just said, well, what if we just worked together and produced a, a more definitive uh, marketable item that would contain the transcribed interviews? And so that is when the ebook came came about that I was learning to use InDesign in, so that I could work with Norma Beecroft to um, just style some of the content in order to package it and have it out into the world. And, and so working, working with her on that, it was really impressive. It was impressive to then connect through the launch uh, and then eventually through producing the print version. And I agree with you that there's this kind of boundless curiosity and this very generous inquiry. It, 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 and th there were these conversational elements where you know Norma would certainly be kind of just matching the folks she's speaking with. And just to kind of give a little rundown, among the people she was speaking with were Pierre Schaeffer, Yanis Zanakis, uh, also Vladimir Usashevsky, the uh, artist whose sonic contours Norma encountered as kind of one of the first, or I think was her first electronic piece that she heard in a kind of performance context that really sparked her imagination and drove her towards using tape music and uh, pursuing time in electronic music studio. But then also uh, in, in here is Gustav Chimaga, who was in charge of the U of T electronic music studio and who would be a mentor to a number of the CE uh, members, certainly in the early days. And then Jim Montgomery also makes an appearance here. And I, I have to say, I absolutely love the interview with Jim because Norma is being really cutting, like really stark in, in a few of her uh, opinions on the application of electronic music in the early days. And yeah, one of my favorite exchanges, <laughs> I'm just going to try and bring it up. Uh, Norma says, I'm just trying to figure out if it is my contention that the sounds are relatively dull, referring to electronic music. And Jim says, you mean electronically generated sounds? And Norma says, yes. That was the criticism in the early 50s, and I still think that it's a rare piece of music that has some actually interesting timbres. And then Jim proceeds to say, I'm squirming. I've been intricately involved with these sounds uh, for seven years, and I don't find them insufficient. And there's this interesting back and forth about, again, this question of deficiency, and I think it's kind of rooted partially in Norma bringing up some of the early challenges of presenting the music. And I think this is, again, where Norma's um, embodying a few different identities as composer, but also as broadcaster, also as programmer, uh, concert programmer. And, and I think Mar Norma really prided herself on marketing and driving audience with new music concerts, also as a broadcaster, really hosting and engaging an audience in uh, the curious and complex and increasingly eclectic world of 20th century music. Um, but she kind of says it. So here, here was this challenge we had of like, diffusion of sound in an electronic music concert, uh, how that is partially remedied in a certain way in terms of audience expectation when there are suddenly performers who have synthesizers. And that was, that's what Jim was kind of speaking to. But Jim was also uh, defending, speaking up for, hey, you know, there is something different, though, unique and compelling about being an audience member um, who is just getting to sit back and listen to the sound in a collective space, certainly. But uh, but I think that was one of the interesting things that Norma did in this. Is that she didn't just necessarily uh, accept that, oh, this is all working perfectly and brilliantly as, and all as well, is that she was also in certain ways like needling, critiquing or questioning, challenging uh, the, the progression or development of the electronic music that was being presented publicly that was engaged with among uh, engineers, studio managers, uh, students, and artists. But, uh, but I would just say it is uh, a revelation in certain ways to spend time with Norma through this book and Norma's curiosity. Again, it comes through in a lot of ways. And there, there is this wonderful and charming exchange with a number of the performers here. But, but, and then also, again, for folks who have a curiosity about not just, you know, European and, and American domains of electronic music, but there's also conversation with Ben Tambreos, who is working in Montreal, I believe, and, and then Barry Truax on the West Coast. So that there is this really extensive, as you said, uh, representation of different voices, different approaches, different methodologies, thinking 
philosophies around the sound. And, and another person I was really interested, uh, if Norma is able to join, uh, another person that she speaks to is Bill Buxton, who spent some time at U of T and who was another close contact. But, but again, there are a few different perspectives from folks uh, in Canadian contexts on electronic music. And so it becomes a, a, a really uh, unique and uh, helpful resource when you're trying to approximate or appreciate what, what was driving the creativity of folks in, again, in those 70s, 80s, uh, but then also folks reflecting back on the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I agree. I think that the, she was able in her the collection of people that she was able to talk to has has able to, it has enabled us to have a much broader picture than a lot of um, you know publications on yeah. electronic music that tend to either focus on Europe or only focus on Europe and the United States or only focus on France yeah. and Germany like um, you know so obviously for us as Canadians the importance of like you know having Canadian voices in there too but um, yeah I think that she presents us with a much broader swath of perspectives which is really important yeah maybe in uh maybe now um so he's under james montgomery and then just plain old david david yeager if maybe um they can if you're cool to be to turn on your videos and unmute yourself and um, if they can be spotlit maybe they can join us for a couple minutes here yeah and reminisce on the 70s uh and um you know norma's leadership at that time and you know how that intersected with with the CEE and mm -hmm. you know obviously she she also composed y'all a piece in the late 70s um so yes. toss it over to to David and uh Jim if you're able to join us hello everybody hi this is Jim uh, I'm trying to I'm still trying to figure out how to turn on my camera here <laughs> we see you <laughs> You still, uh, I don't seem to have. I should have video. Anyway, uh, well, let me just jump in here, Jim. Um, to just to oh, there we go. Okay. I uh, you know, I was Norma's producer when she was uh, hosting a CBC radio series oh. called Today, and. So we got to know one another extremely well. The uh, music of today was a program that was a one hour weekly uh, network broadcast that preceded the show that I created in 1978 called Two New Hours. Two New Hours ran for, for 30 years. And um, as part of the mix of programming that we included in, in Two New Hours certainly was broadcasts, recordings, uh, and subsequent broadcasts of the new music concerts, uh, concert productions that Norma was um, involved in, in creating. So we had a close working relationship on, on many levels. And um, we shared many, um, many long hours talking about the, the relative merits of, of repertoire and, and the innovations of various, various composers that uh, Thanks to new music concerts, uh, came to Toronto, and it was always it was always a given that they would uh, attend all the rehearsals and those performances with new music concerts, which we then broadcast on two new hours. Those could be said to be authentic performance of those composers' works, and um, uh, so and the parties, Alexa. <laughs> they, <laughs> Yeah, and then Jim, I think you worked directly with her in the office. Yeah, right. She uh, she was my boss for uh, several years. First as a tech, I worked for New Music Concerts as a techie for a couple of uh, years. And basically, Norma, Norma and Bob uh, taught me uh, how to be an administrator. Um, and I, I mean, I could talk for hours about Norma. <laughs> She was an she is an amazing human being, uh, and as as Matt said, um, consistently understated her own position and importance. Um, uh, 
a great sense of not, I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that she recognizes her place in the world, but her, uh, her public modesty was always, was always very impressive. And uh, she could be quite a stingy, I mean, quite a um, demanding em employer. Uh, she had a great sense of the importance of detail. Um, and that was reflected in not only her, not only in the way the concerts were presented, but in the way the parties were presented. Um, one of the things when I was at Tech was we, we, uh, we were inspired to uh, break down quickly because if we didn't get to the party soon enough, the food would be gone. <laughs> so, Even yeah. Ample. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, Jim, David, can I ask just about, because when I look back at the program notes from that uh, December 72 concert with uh, NMC, uh, there was one piece in particular, I was going to ask Norm, but I'm wondering if I could just ask you about it. Uh, and the piece, let's see here, automatic duo. So I think it's you too. You, you had this kind of iterative piece where each each version of the piece you were processing the previous version as part of the performance of the current version um i i, I was so excited to read that i don't think i i don't know if a recording of that exists i certainly haven't heard it if it does though i just wanted to ask you a little bit about that piece if you wouldn't mind talking about that or maybe just your approach because it seems like this concert uh, you had two sets of music uh, varied approaches interdisciplinary approaches um right. It, it was really exciting to read about. Uh, I, I'm curious about your memory of either that performance or some of that era of performance, that those early days. Well, of course, those early days, as you as you express it, um, we were essentially uh, um, the language of live yeah. electronic. I mean, studio electronic music had had existed for for a couple of decades by that time. Uh, works on, on on recorded media, but to do it live um, was quite a new thing, and we we wanted to try everything that's yeah. yeah. Every way it, it it might be done, and um, and so automatic duo was was just one step in that direction. And uh, Jim, I think is, is there a recording in the archive? Do you recall? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not not of that particular performance. The the way Matt described it, though, is is, is exactly the way it worked out. That that uh, performance uh, in three which uh, in which three performances occurred simultaneously mm -hmm. in the fa in the uh, Edward Johnson Building. That was that was amazing, and it was a, a real statement concert for new music concerts, and. Uh, very very well attended all three <laughs> all three simultaneous concerts had standing room uh, audiences and uh, rosenblum's uh, light ensemble which was actually okay. a sort of electronic rock band uh, nexus and us so you got a really broad spectrum of uh, what was going on <laughs> it was great that's Amazing. awesome. We could probably uh, reminisce yeah. about this time for uh, this could have been the whole uh, symposium just uh, reminiscing, but we are going to um, end uh, this portion of the session. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Matthew, for joining us. It's sure. really nice to see you. It's yeah. been too long. Lovely to and see I you all and happy to birthday to the CEE. Yay! Uh, yes. Yeah, great. Great to see you, Matt. Uh, you I'll, uh, I'll be down the street and uh, we'll have a beer. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. My treat. <laughs> Take care. So uh, David and Jim can stay spotlit because actually I'm, they're going to do the next uh, presentation called The Producers, and they're going to talk a little bit more about uh, CE activities and also getting into a lot of this kind of nitty gritty administrative stuff that you actually need to take care of in order to perform uh, music outside of your basement. Um, and so <laughs> David Yeager also is a composer, music producer, broadcaster. Um, as he said, he created two new hours for the CBC Radio 2 network. Um, he retired in 2013 and I think became a bu the busiest he's ever been in his life. Uh, at least that's what I've witnessed. <laughs> uh, 
in, in terms of your composing and your recording and producing that you've been up to. And uh, David Yeager was named a member of the Order of Canada in 2018. So congratulations on that. And Jim Montgomery, uh, also a, a founding member of the CEE as a composer, performer, um, started out on horn, went from horn to uh, electronic music, but also those, those all came together. Um, and then Jim Montgomery is also a student and instructor at the Standing Wave School of Martial and Healing Arts in Toronto. And I know that that practice is very important to you, Jim, and really influences the way that you approach uh, performance and improvisation. Um, so I wanted, wanted to highlight that. So I'm going to pass it over to you two to talk about uh, what happened mostly in the 80s. Okay. Great. Um, In particular, let's see. Oh, there we go. A watershed moment in the early history. Uh, do, 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 do. And to be awake, posting graphic phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, how do I get how do I get down there next to you, Dave? Um, we were uh, well. You, while you're looking for that, Jim, I'll just mention that um, in um, 1985, uh, we were invited to participate in the Holland Festival and uh, Canada External Affairs in its relations with the Netherlands uh, helped to organize a great many Canadian artists' uh, attendance at the 1985 Holland Festival, which is a, a massive event. Um, and it lasts a month. It was during the month of June, um, 1985. And in the case of the CEE, uh, our role was to produce a week of concerts there we at, go. at the Icebreaker. Hey, Jim, take it from there. Oh, uh, yes. Um, the, the Icebreaker, uh, let's see. The Icebreaker was a, it is a, a facility in Amsterdam dedicated to contemporary mostly musical art um we presented this this week-long uh series of concerts in in 1985 in june of 1985 um with a with considerable support from uh, um, external affairs canada um and as part of a massive month-long um exposure to Canadian, uh, to, not just to Canadian music, but to dance, visual arts, um, literature, uh, uh, a, a broad spectrum of work, and also from all across the country. Um, our involvement came about through uh, uh, the, um, the auspices of Jan Wolf, who was uh, the creator, uh, progenitor of the icebreaker, um, and had become aware of us um, through uh, a couple of European tours that we had done um, in the years previous to 1985. Um, Jan made the initial uh, approach to to external uh, mentioning us, um, external had set up uh, um, a method by which uh, arts organizations who were who received invitations could then apply to to the, the Department of External Affairs for support, um, for logistics, for travel, um, and in uh, in our case, they uh, they paid for our tour manager as well, and we got a really good one. Uh, Claire Hopkinson, who you will hear more about later on in the discussion about Comus Music Theater. 
um, Jan's uh, vision for a space um, was sort of, I mean, it, it's it's sort of generally accepted that this is a good idea now, but in the early 70s, this, this idea had not actually taken place. And the, the notion was that you pr produced uh, a location that was a destination, not just for music, but for general um, uh, community involvement. So uh, at the base of any good uh, community involvement, there's food and drink. And uh, that was what the icebreaker provided um, as, a, as an entry way. So it was a combination of bar, uh, cafe, um, uh, restaurant, but uh, inside uh, was, a, was a concert hall uh, that was uh, completely isolated from the, out, from the activity around, the, uh, around it. Um, and the, the, as we discovered when we arrived, um, incredibly well equipped, uh, absolutely soundproof. And um, so inside, <laughs> inside this uh, 19th century building, uh, eight story building, was this uh, marvelous little cafe, uh, excellent food, uh, and uh, excellent drink, uh, and uh, this around, I, I believe the, the number was 144 seat uh, theater uh, on, on uh, tiered seating, great sight lines, um, very intimate uh, connection to the, to the stage, the uh, artists, uh, audience thing couldn't couldn't have been better, and uh, the technical support uh, from sound reinforcement to uh, lighting, just everything was just top notch, and they gave us the space for a week, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, I will talk. I'll let David talk about the uh, repertoire selection um, since that was a very significant part of what we decided how we decided to go about this yeah and uh, um, the fact that we were offered the the chance to produce a whole series over the course of a week five concerts in a week uh, provided us for the first time I think in in the history of the CEE uh, a chance to, to truly uh, express, if I could put it that way, uh, through the concert performances, the, the spectrum of, of musical activities that, that we embraced and that we're, that we're instigating and that we're all about, basically. Um, and of course, we were going to perform our own works because this was uh, obviously an ongoing a preoccupation, but we also spoke together, the members of the CEE, uh, about those musicians in Canada who were truly inspired, and who, with whom we we enjoyed performing, and uh, invited a, a selection of really fabulous performers to to come with us. Uh, Lawrence Cherney on the oboe. Rivka Golani on the viola, um, Monica Gaylord, the pianist, uh, the Armin electric strings, the, the, the three Armin siblings. And then some of the, uh, some of the repertoire that we wanted to do, actually, um, we asked Jan Wolf and, and, the, member, and, the, uh, and the administration of the, of the icebreaker, if there were Dutch musicians who would be disposed and available uh, to perform with us? And the answer was an affirmative, a very strong yes. Uh, and uh, we had a number of fantastic Dutch musicians uh, who um, who joined us. Um, we um, uh, we actually did not play any Dutch music. Uh, because we didn't see that as part of the mandate of the, of the series, but we played a, a wide spectrum of, of Canadian music and uh, uh, 
uh, and individual works by, by ourselves and also some of the early collective works. Uh, for example, there's a, a work uh, for accordion and electronic synthesizers uh, that, um, that the, the four of us collectively composed and uh, with a, a Dutch accordionist, we, uh, we rehearsed and, uh, and prepared the, that work. I believe the title, is it Camden, Jim? Uh, was it, yeah. Or is it Davies? Davies, yeah. Right. Those, <laughs> they're all streets where, the, where various uh, manifestations of our studio occurred. And uh, yeah, this one was Davies. Yeah, right. Um, uh, and um, in fact, there were a few acoustic works on the program. For example, uh, Larry Lake's uh, trio for uh, flute, viola, and and bassoon uh, was one of the handful of, of acoustic works. Um, and um, uh, let's see, we, um, uh, Monica Gaylord learned my composition, Quivi Sospiri, which was uh, an early work for, uh, for really virtuoso piano and, uh, and, and synthesizers. Uh, that's a work that actually, for me, is particularly important given it's had multiple productions and multiple recordings uh, released. But in that case, uh, Monica was a very strong um, soloist and and uh, provided great support for, for the other the other repertoire. But basically, we uh, we we got together and and we just we oh I should have mentioned Peter Hannon I believe was also along um, uh, as as one of the uh, performing musicians and and a composer whose whose work uh, he played. So he played both his own work and. Uh, some of our works as well. Um, I think maybe we should move on because time is limited uh, to just to talk about the role of uh, external affairs in kind of preparing the uh, the ground for this event. Um, I, do you have that uh, document, Jim? Did you want to show uh, external affairs report? Um, external affairs took it on themselves to um meet members of the Dutch musical community uh, in the months before June of 1985 and really prepare the ground. Uh, they, they met with uh, I think eight different music critics in, in, uh, in Amsterdam and in other Dutch cities um, and met with um, uh, publicists and other important, um, important fixtures of the, the musical community. And the result was that this entire month long event, not only to mention our week at the icebreaker, uh, audiences were very, very strong. And um, in the report from external affairs, they talk about basically the, uh, the, the model that this represented for, for generating, you know, local regional uh, uh, audience support and audience, provoking audience interest in, in an event of, of massive Canadian content. And um, basically the halls were, were all full, extremely well, well attended. And um, well, maybe we don't really need to see that, that report generally, you know, that, Basically, it's, it's, it's a, it was a summary of, of, of the whole event and uh, was proclaimed to be a, 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 for, a, for essentially a, a, a huge success, uh, maybe a qualified success because there, there were a couple of areas that did attract uh, criticism, it wasn't ours, but uh, in some of, the, some of the disciplines. Here's the program of the Holland Festival. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a 60 page booklet uh, detailing all of the different uh, activities that took place. Yeah. I think for, for me, what, what 
uh, continues to stand out about this event was the, the enormous uh, allocation of resources in Holland, particularly. Um, there was uh, a, re a research period uh, of up to six months involving tour uh, uh, curators touring across the country all from Vancouver to Halifax. Um, and then the uh, leaving aside the <laughs> the enormous expenditures for travel for accommodation uh, um, it, it it was an, an an enormous undertaking and the interesting thing is that uh, Holland goes through this exercise uh, once every two years uh, so it it represented um, from from a Canadian perspective uh, a wonderful uh, aspirational model for, for for future work. This is not. I'm not. This is not at all to denigrate the uh, the contribution of external affairs, which was sizable um, in in any context. In the context of any uh, country's support for its arts, uh, it, it was commendable. The uh, the report that I was looking for um, there was a uh, external affairs obviously was interested to see what was happening to its investment, so they sent uh, a number of people to uh, monitor or not monitor but, but to report on uh, the, the various successes of the or lack thereof um, of the, of the event over the over the total months and. Uh, we wound up with a copy of one of them, uh, which which is which is the document I was hunting for. But anyway, the the the, the overall impression from this particular reporter was that uh, the average Dutch citizen was somewhat uh, overwhelmed by the presence of all these Canadians, particularly <laughs> particularly in Amsterdam. Although this 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 festival is by no means limited to Amsterdam. Um, uh, briefly, one one of the non CE uh, re related events was Ra, which was which is a dusk to dawn composition by uh, R. Murray Schaefer, a uh, Canadian composer who often is referred to as our Murray Schaefer. Uh, but th this is depicts the transit of Ra, the sun god. Uh, when the ch when his chariot goes down at dusk, his traverse through the underworld and his reemergence at dawn. Uh, it involves uh, um, a cast of, I won't say thousands, but a, a cast of dozens, <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a it's a marvelous work. I actually uh, had the uh, the privilege of experiencing this in Toronto. We didn't, we were not, unfortunately, we weren't on at the same time in, uh, or we were on at the same time in Holland, so I didn't see the Dutch performance, but incredible piece, all of which was, uh, all of the travel and the transportation and the, for which was underwritten by external affairs. Uh, all in all, um, I don't think this kind of um, commitment to uh, the arts uh, by national uh, com commitment. I um, I don't recall it being um, report uh, repeated uh, in any significant way uh, since. Uh, so uh, we were very privileged to be involved in this, and it and in fact, this experience had a had an in, um, a very positive. Uh, influence on the on the future development of the CEE. Um, we had just transitioned from a quartet, quartet uh, to a trio. Uh, this this experience validated that trans that transition and uh, opened the way to several uh, major projects that uh, followed hot on its heels. Yeah, as such. I you could use the word, the expression, uh, the 
the week of concerts at the Holland Festival really was a water moment, shall we say. And uh, in the few years coming after the, the Holland Festival, uh, for example, we record, we released our first uh, CD recording, uh, Catbird Seat. Uh, we made our first uh, appearance from the symphony in the production of Stephen Gelman's uh, Universe Symphony. Uh, a massive piece, a five movement piece, Mahlerian in its in its scale, which we performed. Um, uh, as actually, there were there have been five productions. Now there's Catbird Seat. There's there's the image of the the the, the first CD. Alexa had mentioned our first LP was produced in the seventies. Catbird Seat actually was uh, was offered as a twentieth anniversary. Uh, project. So <laughs> it was uh, at that time, um, you know, we were beginning to have a, a sense of, of, well, maybe not exactly maturity, but uh, the CE had, uh, had become uh, of an, an institution of importance to the development of, of Canadian music. And certainly through the, the commissioning activities that that we undertook. Um, we asked uh, a wide spectrum of Canadian composers to, to write for us, including Norma Beecroft, who, uh, who produced a work called Consequences for Five and uh, uh, for the CEE plus Karen Kieser, uh, pianist. And um, uh, that work does exist. It was recorded and released on an LP uh, and the Radio Canada International uh, uh, Canadian Composers series. Uh, quite, a, quite a fine recording actually uh, exists of, of Norma's, Norma's work. But, uh, but uh, finishing up on, on the Holland Festival uh, experience, um, really it was a touchstone, a watershed and a touchstone to bigger things to come. And uh, at least as far as the CE, and development were, were concerned. And uh, uh, it was, we, we, we focused on this for, for today's presentation because of the, the significance of, of this historical moment in, in the life of our organization. Well, thank you so much, David and uh, Jim for giving us the insider take on, on that whole thing. Obviously I've studied the documents and, and uh, it's great to hear firsthand. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions. I'm keeping my eye on the chat, so you can just feel free to type questions there. I'm happy to read them out. You can also raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Um, if you wanna ask a question out loud, anyone in the space is welcome to go over to that lovely microphone there so everyone uh, can hear. So time for questions. Well, I guess we answered it so thoroughly. <laughs> list, Carly list. Oh yeah, there's Colleen. Holland Festival ran a month, the month of June. Colleen was asking, how long did the Holland Festival run? Or did you mean like for how many years did they hold I think, it? I think Colleen is asking about how many years or was this a one-off? You know, I'm not sure whether the uh, whether the festival is is uh, is still an ongoing um, whether the the actual Holland Festival is continues now or not. I know that uh, I do know that for the next decade at least uh, there were there were further uh, iterations of the festival. The Canadian involvement. The, remember that the festival <laughs> they sort of uh, did Canada right in this in this year, uh, and so the the focus of the festival shifted at each each uh, every biannual for each biannual event. Um, there was no 
uh, official connection to the to the festival from Canada uh, after this event that I'm aware of. Jim, I see Robin Elliott has asked, did we bring our own equipment? And uh, we do you have the document of the carne? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, Robin, we did. And, uh, 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 it's the carne, the customs document that shows, there you go. That's that's what we brought. You can you can expand that if you like. Uh, the detailed, you see all the synthesizers there, the microphones, the amplifiers, uh, and the estimated value thereof. So, um, as you can see, uh, well, these this was just before the era of the polyphonic synthesizer. These these are for the most part either monophonic or duophonic instruments. Um, we acquired our first polyphonic synthesizers just after this, and um, which of course changed the repertoire in immensely. But um, yeah, it was it was a lot of stuff. We had packing <laughs> built. Yep. Robust. That's why that's why God gave us tour managers. Right? Yeah, Claire Hopkinson was absolutely brilliant as tour manager. So, yeah. Yeah, that but, was my question too. And maybe just to um, extend on Robin's question, um, I mean, he, he's also saying like, was there issues around different voltages? I mean, you're playing electronic instruments, you need power. So how did you work that out? And also, did anything get damaged um, between here and there? And how did you figure that all out? Yeah, I'm just uh, the, actually the the power converter is right there uh, on the carnet. Yeah, there it is. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, so basically we the we we got a really hefty uh, transformer, and then ran the entire setup through the, through the transformer, so we didn't have to change any of the voltages for any of the equipment. Um, uh, in terms of damage, um, nope. Um, uh, Air Canada did us proud this time. <laughs> they That's did. good. That's not the story that we're hearing lately, but uh, <laughs> yeah. very glad for you all. Right. 85. We have time for maybe one short question, if there's another question. Um, so you, you know, you all were still, I mean, you weren't, you weren't graduate students anymore. So you weren't young, young. But you also, but you are still relatively young. <laughs> so what would you recommend for uh, musicians taking on, you know, their first, or like, not their first, but a big, you know, oh, that, ocean tour. Look, there are, I mean, the, the, the creative ferment uh, now, um, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough now that I've seen several ups and downs in terms of uh, economic uh, situations and what, how the, that has impacted on, um, support public support for the arts or public non-support for the arts um but the the creative ferment the 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 new kids keep coming and uh, nothing i mean an artist will create uh no matter what uh the circumstances and uh there's uh, the current crop uh are no different they're uh, performing in uh, uh, I mean, if you uh, like Matthew Matt's place, uh, the Transat Club, uh, they're busy all the time. The current iteration of the music gallery has uh, a 50, 60 concert season. So the 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 artists, uh, the, there's no lack of artists, and um, and there's no lack of creativity, both in terms of the creation of work. But in terms of the of the, the creation of opportunities to put that work in front of the public, so uh, that's one aspect 
of the the current situation of of which i am not pessimistic <laughs> I, I love your optimism, Jim. Probably we should um, um, end it there. And let's thank Jim and David for their presentation and sharing those important you. experiences. Our pleasure. Okay. Thank you. And what? We'll, and we'll continue to see you. I mean, this is the CE fifty, so you're gonna keep the you're gonna keep showing up, and we love it. <laughs> Great. Great. Uh, up next is Dr. Colleen Renahan. A dear friend um, who is associate professor and Queen's National Scholar in Music Theater and Opera at Queen's University. Um, a prolific scholar with many, many publications. So make sure you Google scholar here. Um, and also check out her 2020 book, The Operatic Archive, American Opera as History, which was published in 2020. Um, and we and we'll make sure that we re, we're, we're going to remove um, the spotlight from the previous presenters and only spotlight Colleen, please. Uh, and her presentation is entitled "Grand Opera Musical Brothel: Almost's Night Bloom and the Innovation of Canadian Opera." So let's welcome Dr. Colleen Renahan. Thank you so much. Um, let me just try and get this into, okay, now I can't see folks, no worries. Okay, well, let me try and open the chat. I'm just gonna move this over here. Okay, can you, can you hear me okay? Is the sound all right? Okay, great. I'm gonna assume there's nothing in the chat and that we're fine. Um, well, first, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Alexa Voloshin for, um, organizing this amazing day. It is so wonderful to see so many um, colleagues and mentors here on the screen, including um, my dear mentor, Robin Elliott, um, and also Matthew Fava. It's so nice to see you here as well. Um, so lovely to be here. Um, second, a warm congratulations to the CEE on this, your 50th anniversary or birthday. Uh, this is very exciting. And uh, finally, a huge thank you to David Yeager and Jim Montgomery, uh, Michael Batri, Claire Hopkinson, and Billy Bridgman for the fabulous conversations that helped me with this research. And I look forward to more as this all continues to unfold because I continue to learn so much about um, this work. It's a real puzzle putting this all together. So, um, you know, David and Jim have been really generous in their time and in sharing resources with me. Um, that's been super helpful and I look forward to to conversations to come. So um, this presentation focuses on a, a group called Comus Music Theater, as, as I'll explain. And I've tried to focus a little bit um, on the contributions of the CEE, which were, of course, integral to uh, this particular production. Um, OK, so in the 1970s and 80s, a flurry of activity in music theater, a genre that defines itself by its innovative and experimental approach to works of new opera or music theater, and often both or neither, uh, prompted the creation of several new Toronto-based music theater companies specializing in crossover work, along with a creative outpouring of original genre-defying pieces. Despite the pioneering work produced by these Toronto-based companies, this history has all but entirely evaded scholarly study. And I guess this is a theme for, for this morning, so I'm glad that this event is happening and that, you know, Alexa's work uh, is unearthing a lot of this as well. Indeed, while Salzman and Desi in their 2008 book, The New Music Theatre, discuss several international developments that can be characterized under this umbrella, Canada is mentioned only in passing. In this paper, I explore this exciting period of generic experimentation in the history of Canadian opera by focusing on the work of one innovative company, Comus Music Theatre, founded in 1975 in Toronto. I'm interested in ways that the company pushed traditional operatic boundaries and expectations with an eye to experimentation vis-a-vis -vis genre in particular. Comus Music Theatre's production of Night Bloom, there we go, uh, from February 1984, serves as an example of the company's innovations in this respect. With a, libr a libretto by Sean Mackay, based on James Joyce's Ulysses, and music by the Canadian Electronic Ensemble, 
The piece drew inspiration from opera, electronic music, popular music, and music, musical theater. And you can see here um, that in selling the piece to Opera Canada subscribers, um, founder, um, founder editor Ruby Mercer writes that, quote, opera music theater is a thriving, growing art form in Canada. Um, I just find that phrase super fascinating. And I noticed recently that the, if you look at the top of the letterhead, it says Opera Canada, the music theater magazine, which I find super fascinating considering what um, you know, happened sort of subsequently. Through musical and textual analysis and interviews with four key figures in its creation, I will talk today about some of the bold ways that Comus Music Theater succeeded in imagining a new way forward for um, opera singers and for music theater in Canada in the 1970s and 80s through their collaboration with the CE on Night Bloom. Comus Music Theater was operational from 1975 to 87 in Toronto. Its name derives from Milton's Mask of Comus, the god of festivity in ancient Greek mythology and the son and cupbearer of Dionysus. Founded by Michael Batry, Gabrielle Charpentier, and Maureen Forrester, the company sought to revolutionize music theater by presenting works that engaged with other media, as well as with theater, popular music, dance, and performance art. As the CEE's Jim Montgomery described it, Comus sought to pursue this particular medium as an extension or outgrowth of opera into the 20th century under the rubric of music theater. To achieve this, Comus undertook a diverse series of programs and activities. Its first production, Harry's Back in Town, was a Broadway musical developed and directed by Bautry with librettist Tony Thomas and music direct director Peter Mann, and was based on the music of songwriter Harry Warren. The musical ran for 14 weeks in the fall of 1976. The company's second in June 1977 was Minotti's The Medium, with Maureen Forrester in the title role. It continued through the next decade, commissioning and producing new works of avant-garde music theater. The artistic roots of Comus's founders were diverse, thus contributing to the adventurous and innovative spirit of the company and its endeavors. Maureen Forrester was an internationally renowned contralto performing on the Metropolitan Opera stage. Gabrielle Charpentier composed for the Stratford Festival and was a significant poet, in addition to being a first-rate composer. As Franz Malouin writes, quote, in Charpentier, all the performing arts converge, end quote. One of Michael Bautry's formative experiences was his early training at Simon Fraser University as resident in theater in 1965, where he met Armory Schaefer, who was resident in media arts. Um, as Bautry explains, and I'm quoting him here, it was through him, Schaefer, that I first became interested in the philosophical and theoretical combinations of the arts, the Gesamtkunstwerk as Batri called it, end quote. Batri's background in history was in straight theater and to some extent musical theater. Batri's work at the Banff Center for the Arts and the Stratford Festival served as outlets for his unique, uniquely interdisciplinary ideas about the training of music theater artists and the ideal form and future of the genre, which were further honed at, um, in his work at Comus. And I've written about Batri and the Banff Center and the Stratford Festival and the sort of innovation of music theater in those contexts in uh, uh, an article in the Journal for the Society of American Music. For many Comus productions, uh, performers came from a variety of backgrounds. In fact, the encouraging and training of truly multimodal singer actors in music theater was a central aspect of the company's mandate. While operatic voices were employed, the most famous example being, of course, that of Maureen Forrester, um, British Columbian uh, Calla Krauss was a belt singer, and Avo Kitesk, Carolyn Tomlin, and others were primarily GNS singers in the Toronto area. Night Bloom's combination of popular genres in a haphazard way was referenced immediately on the handbill, which features, and the poster, I guess, suppose here, not, um, which features not accidentally Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, Bernstein's West Side Story, and Roger and Hart's Pal Joey. The musical score was composed by four of Canada's leading composers, David Grimes, David Yeager, Larry Lake, and James Montgomery, members of the CEE. The dance sequences were choreographed by Don Calderwood, which helped to blend the fantastical with reality. Modal mixing was evident on many levels, including the mixing of dream and reality, which was supported by both the costume and set designer, Reg Bronskill, and lighting designer, Harry Frayner. As advertised in the press release of January 13, 1984, 
The piece, quote, focuses on the memories, desires, and fears of Stephen Dedalus and Leopold Bloom, whose hallucina hallucinations take form and come to life before their eyes, end quote. The subject matter, Joyce's Ulysses and Portrait of the Artist, was decidedly lowbrow in terms of its content, certainly a, little, uh, a more gritty operatic subject than most, though of course opera's history is peppered with examples that mix low and high forms. In a Toronto Sun article, Wilder Penfield wrote, quote, to see it in rehearsal was to be disarmed. The wild words have been swept into a fantasy, both exotic and erotic. Intellectual raunch was one phrase that came to mind, end quote. And Lynette Fortune from the eye opener is quoted as saying, grand opera, musical brothel, Night Bloom has volcanic potential, end quote. Investigating the work's sound world is a challenging endeavor since recordings of the final product are, are sonically less than ideal and several se sections are missing in the extant sound files. These pieces, in addition to a box of materials that Jim Montgomery of the CEE lent to me, and in addition to interviews with um, four of these creators, have nevertheless offer offered me an opportunity to hear into the author's intentions for the piece. I've spent time putting pieces together with David Yeager, a founding member of the CEE over several in-person visits. And again, I'm very grateful to David for all of um, his time with this. The fragmented feeling of the narrative was a reflection of both the literary and musical models of its creative sources. Joyce's literary style is of course characteristically fragmented and the narrative of Ulysses is categorically dreamlike and non-linear. Littler wrote, <clears throat> that the piece gives, quote, theatrical form to Joyce's own stream of consciousness techniques. Continuity fragments, images overlap, thoughts tumble across one another, end quote. And in support of this, the work's musical forms also reflect nonlinearity, fragmentation, and a sense of dreaminess that is partially a result of the wide array of musical traditions and styles that are included in its score. The involvement of the Canadian Electronic Ensemble was also significant in the challenges it presented to traditional conceptions of music theatre and opera, um, both in terms of its musical vocabulary, but also of its compositional approach. Hopkinson describes the Canadian Electronic Ensemble as, quote, the rave revolutionaries of the music theatre scene, and they were up for experimentation, she said to me, end quote. The group had collaborated on two previous music theatre projects prior to their work on Night Bloom. Gregory Levin's and John Morell's Electric Gospel in 1980, and Eye of the Beholder that same year, by Michael Bot uh, directed by Michael Botry. As it had done in its two previous music theater collaborations, the CEE created the score by way of a unique collaborative model, collective composition, whereby each member composed several scenes that were then stitched together to form the whole. As you can see on the image here, I apologize, it's a little bit small on my screen. I hope it's a little bit larger on yours. The collaborative process Jim Montgomery and David Yeager explained was important, indeed central to their work. And we've heard about this um, also already this morning. Quote, all the creative participants came together with a flexible concept. The idea was to give and take so that the theater people could play theatrically. Build it, then critique it, then knock it down. That was just phase one, end quote. Jaeger and Montgomery noted the uniqueness of this kind of working style, particularly in opera at the time. The presence and resonance of the electronic sound throughout much of the piece lends a kind of disorientation and dreamlikeness to the piece, particularly when it is accompanied by echoes, ghostly and disembodied voices, and pitch bending. The collaborative model was particularly new in music theater at the time, and in time became central to the genre, the equal contributions of all creative artists involved in the endeavor. Um, although I'm needing to think more about examples where, um, you know, uh, the actual composers that, that we have, you know, several composers working on a, a single piece of music theater. Um, and I'd love to hear, you know, other examples if, if others um, have them. One of the most fascinating aspects of the piece and one that defined it for Comus's creators is its generic fluidity its refusal to abide by the traditions or parameters of either opera or musical theater. This is, as Salzman and Desi explain, a characteristic feature of new music theater, the off-Broadway of opera, as they describe it. Penfield described Nightbloom as such, 
quote, the score was consistently melodic and Mozartian and musical comedic as it was modern. The extensive use of synthesizers, synth synthesizers, excuse me, seemed to provide an affordable way of upholstering the arrangements, end quote. John Craiglin distances it from opera slightly, however, when he writes, Night Bloom is music theater, i.e. theater with a musical score and actors that sometimes sing after a fashion. Its relationship to the music theater of Gershwin, Bernstein, and Sondheim, claimed by the producers, was not immediately clear in last night's premiere at Harbor Front's premier dance theater. But neither does it risk being confused with traditional opera, whose plots are not likely to be derided by those who attended the performance of Night Bloom. End quote. And yet, as we will see in the few examples that I brought to share with you, the operatic is never completely abandoned. So it's this interesting kind of uh, meeting space between opera and musical theater that I'm really interested in, um, both in the genre at this, in this period, um, and then also in this piece in particular. So the piece begins, for example, with a folk song of sorts that emerges amidst an electronic tapestry of sustained and broken triads, reminiscent perhaps of Philip Glass's operas and alternating with a recorded voice that is projected into the theater space. The tenor voice of the folk song sings in a charming, easy tone that leaves the genre and the intention of the piece rather in flux. And this six, um, section was composed by Jim Montgomery. So I'm going to play just a moment of this. And I'd appreciate if you could let me know in the chat if you can hear the audio because I can't see any of you. <laughs> So um, Stephen appears it, later in a solo number in scene five, which is labeled Stephen's Aria with music written by David Yeager. And Yeager also penned Bloom's Aria in scene 1D. Yeager cites Schockhausen and Berio as influences. And we also hear a reference to the Tristan chord near the beginning of the aria, which features a hybrid opera musical theater style and tenor vocal production. But this particular piece shows a true tapestry of stylistic influences. The section features the aria leading directly into a duet by Hor 1 and Hor 2, as they're um, named in the score. The piercing timbre of the women um, transcribed a semitone apart, and some of it, um, their, their material also as spoken text, set against a minimalist ostinato is an important maker of the experimental nature of the piece, sorry, marker of the experimental nature of the piece. And the risque nature of both the lyrics, so they say they sing if you see K, C U in T. So it meant to um, also spell out the letters F U C K C U N T. And the screams and unconventional vocalism at the limits of the women's voices, including Stephen's eventual vocal dissolution in this scene as well, are outright rejections, of course, of operatic convention. Um, and I'm just going to play you the beginning of or some of this. Uh, section of Stephen's aria where you will hear the Tristan chord, um, and then we'll move into the, the spot where the, the ladies join him. So here we are.
the interest of time, I'm going to move it ahead to where uh, Stephen is joined by the ladies. Wait a moment. Wait a second. Self, which it itself was ineluctably interest of time, I'm going to move on here. Um, so one of the most fascinating sections of the work is the duet between Bloom and Molly in scene three. And this was composed by Jim Montgomery, the scene where we hear Molly's famous soliloquy. Here, the remarkable combination of the operatic voice of Bloom and the more pedestrian Molly make for a rich tapestry of class, gender, and stylistic tensions. And I'll play you just a little bit of this. <laughs> skip that one there. Okay. Um, I'm sorry not to play a longer clip of that because I know we all love to hear, <laughs> hear this music, but um, just in, uh, I want to respect the, the time here. So by way of conclusion, in addition to Comus's innovations that were extended through daring commissions and collaborations, as we've seen with Night Bloom and their collaboration with the CEE, the company also innovated in terms of their plans for training young performers in a way that supported a more forward-looking conceit of the music theatre performance world, one that supported borrowing and contributing to popular music as well. In 1979, for example, it hosted a series of classes, workshops, and seminars in the basics of music theatre production, performance, and dance in its Trinity Street studios. The other important development in this respect was Comus's opera reading series that provided much needed opportunities to workshop and perform works by Canadian composers. In 1987, Comus was in discussions with the Canadian Opera Company about the possibilities of Comus's work encompassing the COC's experimental arm, though plans didn't ever pan out in this respect. The company closed that year, though its impact on the history of music theatre in Canada cannot be underestimated. Batri once said to me, Quote, even an institution, if an institution doesn't survive, the ideas that it's been pushing out do, and the people who have been involved with them, even if the institution dies, they carry those ideas forward, end quote. And this is also, of course, true of the CE and their enormous impact um, through um, their long history of work. The ideas and energy sowed during Comus's time acted as a catalyst, and its life force um, can be felt in perhaps most directly, um, I, I think, the work of Tapestry New Opera in Toronto, which was formed as the Tapestry S Singers in 1976 and incorporated as Tapestry New Opera in 1979, and is of course thriving today in Toronto as a site of innovative new work um, of music theatre, innovative new works of music theatre. So just to leave you on a tantalizing note, David Yeager contacted me earlier this year about a discovery. Uh, this is a Umatic video cassette, and uh, here's a photo of it. And note that the label says Night Bloom Part 3. So I received this in my email inbox and gasped. Um, so stay tuned for a report on what we find on this video. I'm very excited to try and source a Umatic player, <laughs> which is tricky as it turns out. Uh, but I, I really uh, can't wait to see what this what this um, discovery holds. Thank you again so much um, and to Alexa for the invitation, also to David and Jim for your generosity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colleen. That was super interesting. Um, and yeah, I can't wait for the next discovery. Um, 
Craig is saying that you can find a player on eBay. So maybe that's the solution. Um, so what questions do we have for Colleen? You can post them in chat. You can raise your hand and uh, be called upon or here in the space, you can uh, come to the front to this microphone. So what's your question? I really feel like all of the questions could be directed towards the creators who are with us. <laughs> it feels so amazing. Um, a little bit intimidating also to have uh, the actual members of the creative team um, here, right? So that's true. <laughs> um, and I do just want to uh, make a small uh, note that when I was asking David and Jim about their work on um, Electronic Messiah, that they noted that they had a similar approach there as what they took with Night Bloom, which is that they divided up the sections uh, with each responsible for, for the different movements. So it seems to be something that worked really well for them in the 80s. Um, I guess one of my questions, you, you, you got to the COC right at the end, Colleen, a Canadian opera company, uh, but that's like 87, you said they were kind of talking. And I'm curious, what the COC was thinking and doing kind of earlier in the decade and in what ways do we understand them noticing uh, what Comos is doing and maybe, you know, it, deliberately deviating or, or trying to imitate or, or ignoring. I'm just sort of wondering the COC as, a, as an operatic institution in, Tor in Toronto as well, what was happening in the early 80s? Well, that's a great question. I mean, m most of my work has been, you know, in like sort of the area adjacent to or separate from the COC because I, as as far as I know, or as far as, you know, I've learned this, the Canadian Opera Company has been rather conservative for, for good, probably reasons, right? Economical reasons or, um, but, you know, creatively, at least in, in terms of the things that I'm really interested in, the more interesting work has been undertaken by these smaller companies um, who were sort of adjacent to the COC. And there seemed like to have been throughout its history, this interest in, or at least a, a gesture towards trying to set up a, you know, an arm of experimental work and, uh, you know, that might eventually yield productions that could be um, part of the main stage, their main stage series. But um, it, it has never really happened. <laughs> it's never really panned out. Um, I think there are a few things underway now, and I look forward to hearing, you know, and seeing if those make it to the main stage and what, what those will be like. But um, I know that Against the Grain Theatre has been, you know, most recently sort of a, an official um, arm of the COC and also um, Amplified Opera has been associated with the Canadian Opera Company, but we're never, we never really see the, you know, the impact of these super creative, um, small, dynamic companies actually, you know, come onto the main stage at the Canadian Opera Company. But, you know, Jim and David and others who were, you know, there at the time, like, I would love to know more about, about that, for sure. Um, we have a comment from uh, Robin, first of all, that's, uh, saying you did a great job, but also mentioning that uh, Paula Spardakos is here, who was involved in Shibari. I, I haven't heard of that production, but maybe another person you could be talking to. And then Craig um, is just curious. I mean, you talk about tapestry, you've mentioned against the grain. Um, yeah, what are you seeing that's sort of exciting and innovative around uh, opera music theater today? What's exciting you? Sorry, could you repeat that, Alex? I was sort of busy reading this, <laughs> this comment, trying to find the question in the chat. Uh, just wondering what specifically you find exciting right now about opera music theater. You mentioned tapestry, you've mentioned oh, yeah. against the grain. Um, obviously in the eighties, this production was like super innovative. What excites you today, 2022? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the genre is really like blossomed and it's it's I think thriving it's really alive and well so in Canada yeah of course like um, tapestry I think is like a leader in this field in Toronto absolutely um, against the grain um, as well amplified opera is a new opera company in Toronto that 
is doing really interesting things as well. And as I said, is now associated officially with the Canadian Opera Company, which is um, really interesting. And I, I look forward to seeing how that, you know, what, what that brings about. Um, of course, in the United States, I'm now blanking on the name of um, uh, the woman who runs a, oh my gosh, it'll come to me in a second here, um, a new opera company in New York City who takes on, someone can drop her name in the chat. I've just, it's escaped my brain. Um, produces and commissions new opera, new music theater um, productions as well. And also um, Nancy Rhodes's um, Encompass Music Theater in New York, um, which was founded in 1975 and continues to, I think, create uh, pieces of, of new music theater. But Michael Botry spoke a lot about that at the time. Um, Fawn in Toronto, thank you. And other, lots of emerging companies in Toronto doing really interesting music theater work. And of course, there's lots of this in, in Europe as well. Like in, you know, there's a lot of new music theater work happening um, as, as well. So, you know, it's thriving. It's, it's a thriving, it's a thriving, uh, you know, creative industry, I think. And there's lots of really interesting work coming out of it. But this like, you know, uh, this work was that when I speak to you know, Jim and David, and when I spoke to Claire and Billy and and Michael, it sounded so fantastic. This, like, the spirit of um, ad, ad, adventure and and like abandon and the willingness to take risks and to. Um, I mean, Claire told me stories about the company just you know themselves doing all of the groundwork in terms of running around Toronto, getting all the materials for these productions, and you know, working till all hours and like this this commitment to the art and to the creative process was, um, it sounded like an amazing place to be. I really would have loved to have been there um, for that, so. And of course, you know, we don't have a time machine, so we can't give you that, um, Colleen, but I think perhaps we can ask every, but every artist out there working and doing interesting work, try to document your work as much as possible so that uh, scholars like Colleen, when they are trying to look at it after the fact, there's, they're not, they don't get sad over all the missing uh, materials. So record, photograph, video, document, document the hell out of this stuff. Um, because it, you know, you might be distracted with other things at the time, but it will be important 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line to have that, that documentation. So let's uh, thank Dr. Colleen Renahan for sharing this important work. It's so lovely to see you. Uh, thank you so much, what a wonderful day. That's the end of our first session. So we're going to take a break until 1115. And then we'll be back for a session that's looking at creating music, um, but not together. So whether your network dispersed long distance uh, in real time, outside of real time, we'll be looking at that through uh, three different lenses. So have a good break. Okay, welcome back to session two, I'm going to invite graduate student uh, Bradley Fletcher to come up and do the introductions for this session. Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, session two of uh, CEE 50. This is entitled Networked, Dispersed, and Long Distance Electronic Music. Our first presenter is from CEE uh, itself, Paul Stillwell. Paul is a musician, composer, and a longtime member of the CEE. He also uh, performs uh, solo as Intrepida, and he has an improvisation collective called Not Your Average Worker Beats. His presentation is entitled Pass the Track. Hi, everybody. Hoping you can see and hear me okay. I can see on the screen that I'm there. Didn't realize I was actually doing a presentation. I thought this was more of a discussion, but uh, okay, let's go. So, back when the uh, back when the uh, pandemic started, um, we were all kind of chatting together over email as we couldn't go and see each other or rehearse together, and uh, wondering what to do. Um, John. Fra, who uh, has also been with the ensemble for a long time, uh, he was uh, isolated in, in Germany. And uh, I thought, what the heck, why don't I keep John going and I'll, I'll make a little, a little track for him to add something to. And uh, we didn't really move on that for a little while. 
And then the rest of the band kind of caught up to the idea and said, why don't we, why don't we start off doing some stuff and we'll do a pass the track kind of thing. I think Rose suggested that. And I said, well, I already have something that I made for John. So, uh, so why don't we start with that? And then John can go next. And then uh, we passed it around and Jim came up with a schedule. Uh, and then we came up with a whole project uh, called pass the track. And uh, basically Somebody goes first, lays down a track, it gets uploaded to Dropbox. The uh, the next person in line picks that up, adds their track to it, uploads that to Dropbox. The next person picks up those two tracks, adds their stuff to it, and so on and so on. Um, I think I have uh, at least Jim, if not uh, if not David, here with me. So if you guys want to chime in at any time, feel free. Um, what I can do now is I can. Uh, I can share my screen if I can find the button for that. There it is. So I thought it would be a, a nice idea to share with you guys kind of the uh, the process and the sounds that, that we had going on. And uh, I'm just going to mute a few tracks and show you how things developed uh, as we passed the track around. Um, <clears throat> you may notice in the title of my screen here that it's PTT 1 2022. Um, my original mix and master seem to have been misplaced. I know I have them somewhere, I just couldn't find them today. So I quickly brought the original files back together. This may sound a little bit different to, uh, to what you've heard before if you've listened to the YouTube video that we have up online, but it's reasonably close. And uh, I'll just start playing now and hopefully this comes through. Now. Is it coming through now? Yeah, she's good now. Good. So this was the uh, this was the original track that that I had laid down. Um, it's really just a, a very sparse, slow moving drone track uh, meant for other people to add stuff to. And uh, John was the first person to add things, so I'll unmute John now. Sutherland was having so much fun, he contributed two tracks. And that's how this, uh, this particular track got built. As you can tell, it, uh, it really changed. Uh, over time. And this time was not, uh, it was not a day. <laughs> it was not a week <laughs> weeks as we, uh, as we passed the track around. And it was really interesting to see how it unfolded. Um, perhaps, uh, David, you'd like to comment on that? Well, yeah, as you can see, it got thick. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, within the tradition of co-creation that the CEE uh, evolves over over the decades. Um, we all understood that um, you know there would be a mix, and um, so you know don't hold back kind of thing. 
uh, and we didn't, <laughs> as the evidence shows. And what what we're hearing actually in this little example is 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 just a, an all in mix, I think, right, Paul? I, yes, I it, yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, yeah, eventually um, we gave to Paul the authority, the the re the the wish, the the, be the the request that he uh, undertake uh, to to do a a first mix, and uh, which we all then examined together with our our own interests in mind and with our collective interests in mind, and and the result was uh, pass the track number two or number one, excuse me, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Paul of course. Oh, so so we immediately went on to number number two, and then the number three, and there were there were six in the first group. Paul, of course, um, being the the innovative and 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 creative individual that he that he is, uh, had the idea that uh, an animated graphic accompaniment to this sound uh, could easily be well. I don't know how easy it was, Paul, but it could <laughs> could be added. It wasn't. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll throw it back to you because you you had this brilliant idea and, and what you came up with was spectacular. Yeah, I think uh, I'm I'm trying to remember what I did for the first one, and uh, I think um, I just I'd been playing around with some fractal animations, and uh, I just I blended them all together as as well as I could to uh, to match the music that was going on. And uh, that became the video that got uploaded to YouTube for this one. Um, when it came to pass the track number five, I was inspired once again to, uh, to create another video. And the process for that was similar, but substantially different. Um, for that one, uh, the video itself is kind of a bit of a live performance as well. Um, as you can tell from the mix, I've switched over to looking at pass the track too. You can see that um, we did do some mixing. Um, the there wasn't a whole lot that was cut from each performer's track, and uh, we tried to stay true to the intent of each performer. Um, volume levels do get uh, do get adjusted. Uh, there's some EQ that has happened as well, you know, in normal mixing tradition to make things more clear. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot that was done uh, on to each individual uh, performance other than balancing things out. Um, the levels uh, that came in from each performer were quite different. Going back to the video for Pass the Track 5, I actually loaded a fractal clips and other clips into uh, and other video clips that I have hanging around uh, that I created into a uh, VJ program. And uh, so I was able to get uh, some stuff happening, some effects happening on the video clips uh, in time with the music. Um, so past the track five kind of represents a, a, a big step forward in the way I create videos uh, for music. Um, Jim, did you have anything that you wanted to add about past the track two before I go and, and play a little bit of this? Because uh, you were you did the honors on this one and kicked us off. Yeah, I uh, no, uh, I don't have much of substance to add except that what one of the interesting things about the entire project was that there was very little material uh, that didn't generate it originally that didn't make it to the final cut. Most of the, uh, as Paul said, most of the editing was simply adjusting levels uh, and making sure that. Uh, People didn't get buried, or at the same time, weren't burying other people. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, let's kind of do the same thing that we did to the uh, to the first one. We'll start we're, we'll start listening to what uh, what you put down first, Jim, and uh, and I'll enable things as we get there. <laughs> Do you remember what instrument you were using for this, Jim? It 
was sounding very synthy at first. Yeah, there's some synthy. There's a lot of processed voice in this too. And then, uh, and then David Sutherland went next. Whoops. Let's do it this way. Lost audio, Paul. You lost audio? I'm not hearing it. Can you hear me talking? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. My microphone was not, was muted. <laughs> that old trick. Yeah. But I don't hear the, uh, the audio of the, I don't hear the music. All right. That's kind of weird. Let's try hitting play again. All my settings seem to be right. Yep, is, that working? is that working now? Yep. All right. Yep. So we'll go back to David, where David comes in there. And then Rose. John decided to add some electronic parts as well as piano, so we've got him to do it twice. As is tradition, the person who went first on the previous track went last on the next track. So we'll just get forward to where I add something in. I think the thing that, that really struck me uh, from going through these and doing the mixing and mastering was how similar uh, the sound was and how uh, it seemed to, to, to when we are together in a room, even though we're passing a track around. Um, the music kind of flows and ebbs uh, and, and takes on a life of its own that we all seem to follow as the track developed. And uh, it, was a, it was a really interesting thing. Thanks so much, uh, Paul, for giving, and, and David, for giving us a little insight into Pass the Track. Um, which of course you can find on the website. And I think you are, is it already on Bandcamp? Are you releasing it as a whole album? It is soon? imminent. Imminent. <laughs> well, we, are, we look forward to that. We are moments away from the release. We are moments. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, if you have any questions, uh, put them down in the chat or come up here to a microphone or put, raise your hand um, in Zoom but you can be unmuted. You already sort of um, ended there, Paul, but I was, you know, because I was wondering how this compared to the last album that you all made together, which was Bluffer's Lookout, in which you were all in a space together um and so yeah what were the 
the similarities and differences as uh, in terms of performance and recording and production? Waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, waiting was the biggest difference. And then, uh, you know, every time, every time somebody completed a track, I think all of us probably jumped in and downloaded it and did our own little mix to see what it sounded like together. Uh, so we all kind of heard it as it developed. It was really cool that way. Yeah. Um, part of, you know, my my vision for CE50 was, of course, that we would talk about the CE. Of course, we would, um, you know, think about their stories and their experiences. But for me, what one of the things that's exciting about the CE is how they are part of a bigger world of electronic music creation, how they are leaders in that, how they are collaborators in that, how they are models in that, that they're part of this, this huge ecology um, of electronic music making. And so the remainder of the session um, is actually not about the CE, uh, but still about this topic about making music outside of uh, shared space, perhaps sharing time, perhaps not sharing time. And so that's what the remainder of the session is for. Um, so let's thank Jim, David, and Paul for sharing this project. And then I'm going to pass it over. Can I just uh, add one? Sure, of course. Alexa, um, I, I had mentioned earlier on uh, this morning um, uh, when there, there was a question from Matthew Fava uh, about a certain piece that in 1972, you know, the language of live electronic music was was new, was being invented. Um, it didn't take long before uh, that that language um, uh, began to mature and 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 to grow. And I, I dare say that uh, uh, looking backwards over 50 years, that you know, live electronic music is is now a mature art form, and it's, it continues to grow like all the arts do. But um, you know, there's been a kind of a feeling of arrival that I I can point to, and uh, be be pleased to have been a part of. Awesome, thank you so much, David. Okay, I'm going to pass it over again to Bradley to introduce the next uh, presenter. Okay, so our next presenter is uh, Geneva Skeen, who is an artist, composer, and an adjunct professor here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Skeen works with sound, voice, architecture, video, sculpture, and her presentation is titled Long Distance Music. Um, hello, hi. Uh, I need a second to join the Zoom. Um, but while I do that, I guess I would like to say thank you, Alexa, for inviting me. Thank you, Studio, for hosting, and happy birthday to the CEE. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear about your work and to hear about it directly from you. Okay, so I think you can, I think you can see my presentation without seeing all the things that I've written down to remind myself of what I'm supposed to say. So, um, right, today I wanna to talk about long distance music, which is a coin, a, a term coined by composer Marianne Almache in the 20th century to describe the, the experience of listening together out of time witnessing time pass without being in the same place. Um, and here's a funny little graph that I made to try to cover the things that I plan on talking about today and how these subcultures connect. Um, we'll look really specifically at some of the artists, works by artists in the blue circles, um, who I feel like really extrapolate and build upon some of the works and creations by those in gray and green. Um, we're not going to get too deep into analyzing the illustration I made here, so let's just jump into phone freaking. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the history of phone freaking, and so I don't want to get too deep into it. But what I do want to talk about is the community and subculture that arrives, uh, arose out of phone freaking. Um, it became sort of an inadvertent and then highly intentional community of kids, hackers, misfits who we're just experimenting with consumer level household tech. Um, I think a, a common thread through all the artworks that we'll be looking at today is there's not necessarily a particularly complicated technology, but the access and the experience of listening that arises out of this uh, experimentation uh, afforded uh, an opportunity for people to come together 
and and discover what it is to use technology when it's liberated from its original intended purposes. So uh, a very broad primer on phone freaking for those who aren't familiar early on, tapping into the phone network, uh, also known as Ma Bell, this sort of crass term for the Bell telephone network, uh, involved rapidly clicking a handset switch in a specific pattern. Those networks needed to be automated, so they switched to tone-based signaling. And the phone freaks figured out that the tones, single and later dual tone pairings, uh, they could actually be replicated and you could make your own free long distance phone calls. Um, so through a not so careful analysis of information that Bell themselves put out in magazine advertisements like this one here that you see on the screen, playing a tune for a telephone number, uh, through PR films that they would put out, through technical manuals that they would just publish and make it available to anyone, anyone could actually go freak the phone. Um, properly tuned pianos or electronic organs could hit the correct frequencies. Uh, the, the line breaking tone was 2600 hertz, so that would give you the sort of uh, false idea that the phone had died, and then you could enter your own phone number. And with a basic cassette recorder, those tones could be replicated and distributed, and all you had to do is hold the cassette recorder up to the mic, uh, you know, the handset. And then further on down the line, anyone with a soldering iron and a breadboard could just make a small port portable device to play them, and thus came the blue box. Uh, here are some images that you can see from this technical manual that Bell put out saying basically, oh, here are all the ways that we discovered that people were inadvertently hacking the phone lines. Uh, what's most successful is speech imitations and whistling and uh, anything you can do that will actually uh, falsely cut off the line. Here you see an actual blue box. Here you see the dual tone pairings for each number and button on a, a, a phone keypad. And so to use the blue box, one would call a toll-free number, and this is very broadly speaking. When the tone picked up, you'd hit a button on the blue box that broadcast the 2600 hertz tone. That tricked the line into thinking you'd hung up, but you'd still be on the line and you'd put your number in the box and voila, connection to all your fellow freaks. Uh, ultimately, enough freakers found each other and they started creating party lines to talk about their experiments with each other and just have these social hangouts via uh, hacked phone lines. Their crew included characters with pseudonyms like Bill from New York, The Glitch, Dr. No, The Cheshire Cat, and Captain Crunch, who discovered that a toy whistle from the box of Captain Crunch could create the correct tone, the 2600 hertz. They developed a huge knowledge base and a huge subculture around freaking via conference call lines. This was likely the first virtual community that we ever had, like early aughts web, Usenet, all of these things sort of came out of phone freakers. Um, this clip that I have here is uh, from Evan Doorbell's Phone Trips archive, and it's like a recording that he made of an early conference call, and I'll just play a tiny bit because it's funny, but it's also interesting. phone freaks all in the line at the same time trying to talk and hear each other. And they're mostly just saying, what's your phone number? Hello? I can't what's your give it out. Number? I can't give it out. Hey, is that you, I can't give out my phone number. Um, so these calls and this community begat publications like TAP and 2600, the Hacker Quarterly. It begat tech innovations, community conferences like this one. And eventually it begat Steve Wozniak. Uh, Steve would prank call the Vatican, posing as Henry Kissinger, apparently, and later, I guess he decided to make Apple. Uh, it also incited a bunch of FBI investigations and a multitude of arrests, despite the freakers' rules to never freak at home. Uh, and if you were caught to insist that the blue box was actually an electronic music synthesizer. Um, of course, as we know, blue boxes stopped working, long distance networks were digitized, we don't use dual tone systems anymore. But in the 90s, the concept reemerged with the wares scene. And for a brief moment, creative programmers were making software versions of blue boxes um, just to reiterate uh, the capacity and to try and work with new systems. Uh, here you see a little where's freak. Um, so what can we learn from the foam freaks apart from the hacker lineage they incited? To me, there's something in this particular excerpt of the very article that led to their demise. 
that speaks at least toward an irreverence of intended infrastructure in service of a humanist essence, toward the possibility of misuse of a service. Am I echoing? Nope, okay. Um, toward the possibility of misuse in service of an idea, reappropriation of the lines of communication for the sake of challenging not just the phone company's authority, but to solve functional puzzles and to find each other in the liberated present. There's something about liberated tools that makes for liberated conversation, that makes for liberated listening, that makes for liberated connection. So now I wanna like talk about a couple of very contemporary examples for the most part. And we'll just like, for the sake of time, breeze through these really quickly. But after it's sort of countercultural start from phone freaking, I can't help but think about noise and performance art and other anti-authoritarian forms that made their way into telephonic format. So a couple examples, here's a performance by Lauren Toswell from 2022 uh, that was live streamed from Salem, uh, incorporating a party line, voice, uh, improvised, uh, improvised speech and amplification. Uh, uh, what, what? Oh. You think you're going to get out? 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 You can't get out. 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 You can not get out 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 pretty different way in a non-party line kind of way it is a local Pittsburgh artist who goes by the universe online who um, is using, I think the gesture of the phone, the way that we use it now, which is especially the iPhone to use uh, noise instrumentation to make like really electrifying performances. Uh, this is a little noisy, a little loud. So just brace yourself if that's um, intense for you. <laughs> And then uh, some of you may know who this is. And I think uh, I really just wanted to incorporate this because it's played such an interesting role in my thinking about telephonic communications and like anti-authoritarian systems. But Longmont Potion Castle is a sort of thrash metal, semi-anonymous semi performance art phone freaker who's equipped with a doctor sampler and a heavy pedal board. And has been making albums for decades where he's largely doctoring his voice, making essentially quasi prank phone calls and like making albums out of these calls. And here's a sort of montage from I think album number four. Hello, Wax Tracks. Hello, Wax Tracks. No, no. Okay. Hello, Wax Tracks. Pardon? Hello, Wax Tracks. No, this is the Waffle House. Our phone just rang and I picked it up, and uh, that's why I'm. I, I, did you call here? No, I uh, know you called yeah. here. <laughs> I did. That's really weird because the phone rang. I, I called. called. Yeah, I know. I must have got wires crossed or something. Is this is the Waffle House? House. What is going on? Oh, I don't know. It's really weird. Huh? That sounds really cool. <laughs> is this the Waffle House? Okay. Oh, hey, okay. Independent Records. This is Corey. Oh. Uh, yeah, so uh, fantastic. If you don't know about Long Longmont Potion Castle, you really should um, go check it out. There's lots of stuff on YouTube. Um, so that's sort of a fringe culture experimentation in the direction of uh, adapting the phone lines. And then there's a sort of hard materials look. So Lori Napoleon is a Brooklyn-based artist and composer. She also goes by Antennas, aka Meridian 7. And she transforms 1930s era operator switchboards into functional bespoke electronic music instruments analog sequencers, modular synthesizers, vocoders, and oscillators. She samples phone lines, recordings of operator communications and synthesizes filtered signals to compose pieces using her instruments, which is a very satisfying feedback loop in my opinion. So you can see here, this is an image of um, one of the early operator switchboards that she's found in an archive. And then here's what she's done with it to transform it into a synthesizer. Um, here's another sort of set of documentation an early switchboard 
what she found inside and then the materials that she replaced it with to make a synth. Um, and then here's just a really brief clip of a performance she did at Issue Project Room with artifacts. One thing I really love about Nicolene's work also is that it's hearkening back to the original users of this technology, which were largely women. Uh, they were also known as speech weavers, which I think is really beautiful when you think about electronic composition, um, weaving together lines, communication, weaving together audio uh, to make a new unified group. Um, and all of this brings me to uh, our muse or my muse for the day, which is Amache and her work City Links. Um, you know, the systems and technologies that we're talking about are always service of, uh, in the service of an idea. And I wanna think about that idea of the construction of listening, how we do it, why we do it, how technology enables us to do it, and how we kind of in 2022, have, in my opinion, maybe started to forget our capacity for it, despite the tools that we have to enhance it. So in the mid 20th century, uh, Amache developed a series of electronic works she called City Links using a 15 kilocycle per second FM quality Bell Lab telephone cable uh, or multiple cables, excuse me, to transport sound from multiple locations across the country to one space, performance, broadcast, or tape. This was called long distance music. She held the conviction that technology would make it possible for our sensory perceptions to expand and stretch, to enable us to reach frequencies unseen in source, but felt in body. Of City Links, she wrote, this installation links spaces distant from each other, but together in time. In spaces selected for dimension and perspective, present to house distant and local sound. She had a funny way of writing, it's hard for me to read out loud. Um, and here we see some photographs of her uh, via the MIT Cavs archive, placing her microphone in a fairly decrepit and empty post-industrial building aside Boston Harbor. Uh, these lines would run to her studio in Cambridge where she'd mix audio from uh, local mics and the Boston Harbor. And she did probably 22 of these over the course of a little over uh, a decade. Here we see her in her studio with the phone blocks. She's receiving signal from Boston Harbor. Um, and you know these works are not digitized, thinking about documentation and how important that is. Um, my understanding is that Amache really resisted documentation because if your work is about constructing a sense of presence, how do you actually document that? If you're always looking at documentation of when people were experiencing the present, you're gonna miss the point. So I think that's thought provoking, but in lieu of actual sonic material, I'll read a small excerpt of Amy Simini's description of her own listening um, to, to uh, recording of, of City Links. Staked on flautist and vocalist Eberhard Blum's comportment with the instrument, the stereo image dissolves after about five minutes into a mono expanse of his filled stillness as droplets, thuds, and thumps creep across the telelink. A second cluster of bolder contributions from Blum coincides with sparse whirs of vessels and planes, and then, like the first, gives way to another long static interval. The tape concludes with the harbor alone, pulsing multiphonics efflorescence almost glow toward audibility, and then sheer apart in and as the corrugated whir of machinery. Velvety hums become spit and sputter as vessels draw close to the mono mic. In and as this passage, smoldering low mids resolve into textured metallic rotations. So less a study of, uh, you know, sound ecology or a site situational piece of research, Amache's investigations were rooted in the act of subjective listening and in the effect of sound on our sense of presence. Like what is there, but also who's there. To this end, she devised early City Links compositions for listening that didn't even include the phone line. And to be clear, I'm making the associations with uh, phone freaks and uh, 
prank phone callers and people who are using the internet. This is not something that she was necessarily concerned about technologically, um, but she's using this technology to experience time, but out of time and to facilitate simultaneous listening and to make place for her audiences to do the same. Um, another example that I wanted to show of someone who's doing something similar is Kamal Patton. Um, he's also fascinated with systems, successes, failures, its futures and people. And here's a little excerpt of an installation that he did in Los Angeles during the pandemic. Um, is this work tell is an ongoing and nomadic work. Uh, it's a platform for performance, study, contemplation, publication. It's taken form in, oops, sorry, uh, drive-through performances, live streams, and a 3D gallery. Uh, it's sort of this ongoing space that's named after um, an archeological term for the accumulated remains left by communities occupying a site over time. especially tell, and then how to basically create a commons for inquiry and exchange and document that at the same time. Uh, the final sort of contemporary example I want to show you is uh, Chloe Alexandra Thompson's Haptic Paradigm, which was another artwork born out of the pandemic. Uh, it was an online space exclusively that housed controls for viewers and visitors and artists to alter audio and video compositions offered by Thompson and her collaborators. So the site would be, you'd log in and there would be materials there. And you'd, if there was, if it was during a live stream, you would see what other audience members were doing with that material haptically. Um, you could touch and it would move the video, you could touch and it would change audio controls. And so you'd be both audience and performer and witness all at the same time over time. This screenshot, which I'm sure you can't see very well, is actually all of the instructions um, for how to engage with the work. Uh, you can still visit the archive. It's at hopticparadigm.com. Um, all of these experiences would relate to each other. All the materials would relate to each other and nothing would be missed regardless of when you logged in. So there are Twitch live streams, there are archives of those, there was the site you could join while it was going but participation was specifically designed for different kinds of abilities and different kinds of access. Uh, here is a little bit of documentation from two of the performances, one from Brenna Murphy and one from D.B. Amerman. So the visuals here by Murphy, the audio is offered by Thompson and all of this has like, since been processed by the users to the site in real time. And these performances would run for about three hours at a time. Uh, here's another one. You know, I want to star six six and go back to City Links really quick and think about how, you know, 
we no longer use the phone in this way. We use Zoom, we use conference calls, we use WebEx, we use um, Twitch, we use all of these different technologies that are intended in some ways for creativity and in some, way, some ways for productivity. And city links, amongst many things, took place amongst a shifting post-industrial nation and an increasingly technological society, which sounds a little familiar, right? Uh, she loved speculative fiction. She was working mostly in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and during a recent conversation actually called Remote Links with musicologist and violinist Amy Semini and artist and writer Bill Dietz, who are both stewards of the Amish archives, Sumanth Gopinath, uh, contended that our, Amashur's explorations to the limits of our physical experience is an inherently anti-nationalist and anti-regionalist impulse. I would add that this is a pro-technology but anti-capitalist impulse. It's pro-embodiment, pro-human, pro-connectivity, pro but anti-consumerist. Attention feels strange now, right? We do this all the time. We This is not novel, what we're doing right now. We're witnessing time out of time. I can even hear myself lagging a little bit, which is interesting. Um, we forget that this experience is kind of fantastical. Uh, it's a sensory wonder. This very conference is kind of a technological wonder. To think about 50 years worth of compositions from people who have constantly been at the forefront of composition and electronics and technology, to have it sort of coalesce in this way across distance and time is really remarkable. Uh, Dietz comments on Almache's cultivated approach to listening, which is to say it's almost psychedelic. It's so attentive to attention that objectivity is constantly undone. And I guess I want to just leave you with the thought of like, what does the sort of interface or the system that we're engaging with do to our information that it's transmitting? How does our way of looking or our way of listening change with technology, a sprawling set of hyperlinks a never ending opportunity to abandon the present and land upon a new one. How many connections can we form? How many can be monetized? But beyond the phone company, the semiotics of infrastructure now command our attention towards the economy, not necessarily feeling or sensing. Taking works like Tell, Optic Paradigm, and City Links, and CEE, our colleagues here today, perhaps there is space that we can take back or take up to be present online together. That's it. Thank you very much. There we go. Now you can hear me. All I was saying was that you can post your questions in the chat, or if you're here in person, you can just um, grab this microphone from me. Uh, Geneva can also see the chat, so yes. you probably can do that. So what questions do you have? I certainly have questions, but I'm, I ran this thing, so I don't like to take over right away. Okay, well, then I will ask my question. <laughs> well, so I, I, ha I have one. Oh, Paul has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it's more of a comment. Um, my day job is, uh, is in uh, network security and has been for a very long time. And uh, your, your uh, investigation or your comments on, uh, on the 2600 group really brought back some memories for me mm -hmm. because that was uh, the alt.2600 group on uh, Usenet is something that we used to follow quite intently to try and protect mm -hmm. our organizations from upcoming hacks and things <laughs> like that. So uh, it really is an interesting connection between, uh, between art, hacking, my day job, and, uh, and my evening job. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, so many of the phone freaks would also be people that worked for Bell Telephone because, you know, the phone company wanted to hire people who knew how to break their stuff so that they could make it more secure. But then, of course, you'd have people who during their day jobs were trying to protect the lines. And then right after they'd clock out, they'd like turn down certain volumes on pre-recorded messages so that the conference call party lines could happen. Yeah, it was a very interesting time. Yeah, I'm sure. I feel like you have more stories to share, Paul, but maybe not when you're being recorded. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> security. One of the questions that came to my mind, um, Geneva, was this, I, you, you stated at one point, you thought that maybe by 2022, we'd sort of lost our ability to listen and, and maybe didn't mean that generally, but maybe um, I'm not going to assume your intentions, but it did have me thinking about Armory Schaefer, um, who developed this, who developed an ear cleaning 
curriculum, right? So he also strongly believed that humanity had lost its ability to listen well, that we were too visual focused. And then of course his ear cleaning curriculum is based on his ideas of sound and music and especially what is beautiful um, sound, which when you study with me, we, we read that and then we also critique it and have a good time with him. Um, but I'm wondering what would be your ear cleaning mm. curriculum of like 2022 humans? Yeah, I think it has mostly nothing necessarily to do with the aesthetics of what you're listening to, but the time and attention spent. And I think what my experience of listening online becomes is a is an act of multitasking or a, a, a kind of like a hypersensitivity or um, readiness to like move along to the next thing and being really, really present, which is so much of what Amache's investigations would do. She'd spend at, like days, weeks, durational times listening to the same feeds of kind of nothing happening to discover tonal centers, to discover like interesting harmonics within these two lines to be able to slow things down, if that's at all possible at this point, that is what is like the sort of humanist perspective here, I think that says, oh, we don't have to operate at this level of productivity. You don't have to operate at the time frame that these tools are designed for. We could perhaps like really slow things down. And I think that's what I actually kind of like about Pass the Track, which is you had to wait, you know, and you collaborated, but it required a lot more time. So I think my ear cleaning solution would be um, slow down. <laughs> slow down, yeah. So Paul, you were like, I had to wait too long, but it was it was good for your ears. It was good for everyone's ears in the CE to just like slow down. Um, and you know, Geneva, we're both teachers here at CMU. How how can we foster that for our students? Because you know they have so many demands too that are yeah. are saying don't slow down, don't slow down productivity, productivity. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I believe a lot in like awkward silences can actually, not in a manipulative way, but they really can be a moment for people to get closer to their thoughts, to like notice. I mean, maybe in a sort of mindfulness way, I guess, but not to be woo-woo about it, but like you're, there's pressure for you to respond and maybe you don't know that there's pressure for you to respond in class. Or maybe there's a moment to really sit with something with the lights off perhaps and like listen to something. Um, I often encourage students to get up and walk around when they're listening to stuff in the room, um, just to get in their bodies a little bit more. Um, so those are some strategies that I think I try to remind students that they have at their disposal that's free. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I know you. I kind of took over. Were there any other questions? Yeah, just a, a comment along those lines. Um, the art of the album has uh, is really something that has suffered, I think, over the past mm. decade, at, uh, mm. extremely. Um, I have always enjoyed putting on an album and listening to that album from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, given the type of work that I do, I, I fall into this multitasking kind of category as well. Well, I'll put it on while I'm working on something else. Um, but I still do make a point of sitting down and listening to an album. Mm. And I'll turn yeah. the lights dim. I don't like to have any kind of uh, any kind of screen on in the room while I'm doing that. Just the just the music, the sound. Yeah, I wonder if there are ways for us to find networked ways of doing this too, which acknowledges that like you're suddenly listening to the things in your house or on your street that adds to whatever listening experience is being shared via streaming or whatever. Um, I think if we're going to acknowledge that we're jumping around between interludes and short tracks on Spotify or whatever, um, let's maybe figure out how to embrace that physically, which is to say like, don't do anything else with your body, but actually expand all of the things that are happening uh, on your auditory horizon. Um, might be an interesting way of doing that together. Sounds like sounds like we have some, some uh, wonderful brainstorming to do. <laughs> <laughs> Future happenings, uh, collaborations, events, classes. Classes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, let's thank Geneva. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'll pass it to Brad to introduce the last speaker of this session. And you can get to it.
Okay, so our final uh, presenter for this session is uh, Jesse Stiles. He is an electronic composer, performer, installation artist, software designer, and professor here at CMU. Uh, Stiles' work has been featured at internationally recognized institutions, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Lincoln Center, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Park Avenue Armory. His presentation is entitled Congregation of Drones. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. I'm joining the Zoom. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to participate in this. Alexa, thank you for putting this together. Uh, Geneva, thank you. That was incredible. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here um, as part of this symposium honoring the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Electronic Ensemble, uh, with whom I was working on a concert just last night, uh, which is very much in line with the discussion uh, I'm about to present about uh, remote music performance. Um, and this will be sort of centered on a, one of my projects, but I'll talk about a few things that I've had to do in recent years. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting uh, an album that I released this summer with my group Congregation of Drones. Uh, and let's get into it. Uh, so Congregation of Drones is a, a duo comprised of myself and Pauline Kim Harris. I've, uh, I've thrown up Pauline's bio here. I don't think I'm going to read it word for word, uh, but you can go to paulinekimharris.com. Um, it's, it's actually, this is cut down quite a bit from what's there. So Pauline is a, a sort of heavy hitter in the, the new music world who has uh, worked with a lot of amazing contemporary uh, composers and ensembles um, and also kind of crosses over into the kind of avant rock world with uh, this long list of collaborators you can see here. Um, and then of course there's me. So uh, I am an electronic musician. I've been teaching here at CMU for I think about eight years. Um, and uh, Pauline and I began performing music together in New York City in some of these various contexts that we, we overlap with them. So in early 2020, uh, Pauline and I set about recording an album uh, and we recorded the first half of that album um, here at CMU on February uh, 27th, 2020. Uh, it, was, it was actually the, I think it was the same day as that concert when the Canadian Electronic Ensemble was here on campus. Uh, Pauline performed in that concert as well. Uh, and that was also uh, 11 days before the, um, the world ended, as, as some of you might remember. Um, so I think 11 days later, the WHO um, declared uh, COVID-19 to be a worldwide epidemic, and uh, all of the shutdowns ensued. And um, suddenly there was like uh, uh, this research in the area of telematic or remote music performance was uh, no longer a fringe research topic, but uh, suddenly of critical importance to um, performing musicians and music educators and people uh, who are just find, searching for a way to participate in music communities during this period of time where uh, very few of us could actually leave our homes. Um, so of course, this area of research uh, did not begin in 2020 and does not have anything to do with the pandemic in particular. Um, there have been pa uh, pioneers in this field of research for uh, a very long time. The first person I thought of was um, Pauline Oliveros, with whom I was very fortunate to be able to work when I was in grad school. Um, Pauline was one of the first artists I worked with who was sort of deeply involved in this idea of remote music performance. This is a paper of hers from uh, what year, 2009. I remember Pauline was the first person I saw like uh, perform over Skype when I was in grad school in 2001. And I was like, holy shit. So ahead of the curve. <clears throat> um, I was also, uh, Geneva's talk made me think about uh, like the sort of the long history of this idea of network music performance. And I was thinking about um, the Telharmonium, which was one of the 
the first electronic instruments. It was uh, built in the early 20th century uh, at a huge expense. It was an instrument that was about the size of a city block in New York City. I think it cost about like $20 million to build in today's money. Um, and it was a it was a for-profit enterprise. And their idea, what, what they actually in fact did was they ran telephone lines all over the island of Manhattan. And a keyboardist was performing keyboard music um, uh, on this huge instrument that was being transmitted all over the island through these lines. Um, but it was also kind of like a, a very poorly engineered network um, because it would pick up people's telephone calls along the way. So it was like, it was basically like a live network streaming music service that was paid for by rich people in Manhattan. So it was going to like restaurants and museums and rich people's houses and they'd be listening to keyboard music, um, but it would also be picking up people's private phone conversations and that would all of a sudden be like mixed in with the music. Um, so Pauline and I were in the middle of making this record, uh, Pauline Harris, not Oliveros. Um, when all of a sudden our ability to travel, uh, because Pauline is based in New York City, I live here in Pittsburgh, was interrupted. Um, one of the first things I had to do during the uh, pandemic was come up with some ways to continue doing my teaching. One of the things I do at CMU is a uh, direct exploded ensemble, which is our experimental music uh, research center within the School of Music. Um, so I uh, over the, the two years that sort of followed the onset of the pandemic um, became, whether I liked it or not, like a, a, a deep researcher in this area of network music performances. I thought I could play just a couple clips of some of the exploded ensemble remote content. <laughs> Uh, this was November 3rd, 2020, so the um, the election was also about to happen in four days. Um, so this concert was presented uh, with the concept that it would be a fully democratic concert. So we gave the audience um, uh, perhaps far too much control over how the concert would happen. So this was on Twitch. Um, the audience could they could do some simple rearrangements of the concert. So for example, there was a voting system in which they could change the concert order. So um, we we had no fixed, we had six pieces we were ready to play and the audience decided in what order they were presented. Um, but then within each piece, there were also controls that were surrendered to the audience. Um, so they could type things into Twitch that would actually change some of the like the synthesizers and processors that the musicians were using um, and it would also change um, the video signals that were in there so you can see uh, many of the performers are pixelated in this particular piece and that was something that was controlled by the audience uh, in this particular concert we were still using zoom which um, some of you might know is not a, a great tool for networked music performance. Uh, we later pivoted to some different... <laughs> this is actually the platform we used last night with the remote concert that we presented with the Canadian Electronic Ensemble. Um, what date was this? This was 2021. And this is a performance that Exploded Ensemble did in collaboration with Activated Animorphs, which is a, um, an inter-college course that's presented here at CMU, combining performance, wearable sculpture, and inhabitable character design. So in this particular piece, there are one, about 20. Mostly in different parts of Pittsburgh uh, that are joined together telematically. Okay. Oh, and then uh, this is just a screenshot from last night. So uh, last night we presented a remote concert with the 
Canadian Electronic Ensemble and Exploded Ensemble. This is a, just a little bit of that. So uh, what you're seeing is uh, four performers in Canada and then uh, several cameras that were set up within our performance space here at CMU. So in the, the lower left quadrant, you see Exploded Ensemble in the ID8 Media Lab and uh, superimposed on all the performers is a generative graphical score that all of the musicians were using um, as their performance. So the musicians were put into four different groups that correspond to the cameras you see. And each of those groups had their own color that was generating these kind of pitch clusters that they were using. Um, and this, this was fully generative, so they had to um, watch the score in order to be able to perform it. Okay, back to Congregation of Drones. Uh, later in 2020, we decided that we wanted to finish recording the album, but we were not able to travel to, I couldn't travel to New York City, Pauline could not travel to Pittsburgh. So we began uh, investigating what would be a usable way for us to record the remaining half of the album. Uh, Congregation of Drones has always been um, focused on performance. So the idea of recording tracks and, and sending them back and forth and, and basically multi-tracking it was um, not the, the idea of our project. So we were actually trying to find a way to be able to perform live together and record it as a high quality audio that we could actually mix into a record. And what we ended up doing to solve this problem was using some networked audio systems developed by Miller Puckett. Some of you may have heard of Miller Puckett as um, the person who first invented uh, Max MSP at, or back then it was just called Max at EarCam uh, in the 1980s. Uh, Miller Puckett also created Pure Data, which is a free open source cousin of Max. Uh, and Miller Puckett is involved in um, a networked music performance system called Jack Trip that has existed for a long time and predates uh, the pandemic. The thing about Jack Trip is that it is um, not super user friendly, and you need to basically reconfigure your internet router um, if you're going to be able to use it as it's intended to, which is for some people just not an option. So, like students who live in dorms can't reconfigure their internet router, uh, and lots of people who have home internet just wouldn't be able to do that because it's not an, uh, a skill that everybody would be comfortable with learning. So um, Miller Puckett, around the pandemic time, came up with um, some slightly easier to use tools, including Nettie McNetface and Quacktrip. Um, Nettie McNetface would be a tool for an ensemble of up to six performers. It's basically an application that they can use that uh, enables them to have high quality, low latency audio over their network without having to reprogram their router. And then Quacktrip, which is what we used, um, is a plugin that you could just drop into like Ableton or Pro Tools or whatever DAW you might be using. Um, Quack Trip would be usable for um, a situation where you had two performers, which so this met our needs very nicely. Um, and it's basically just a plugin. So I was, we were both able to sort of open Ableton on our respective laptops. I put an instance of Quack Trip, Quack Trip on one of my tracks, Pauline did the same, and I could hear Pauline coming through Ableton on a track uh, and in high enough quality that we were able to finish the album this way. Uh, I, I found it to be a, it surprisingly usable. This is just, uh, this was a review of the album that came out a couple of days ago in which they happened to be specifically talking about the difference between the first half of the album, which was recorded in person and the second and half. Um, so, uh, you know, if, it, if somebody said this on a, an experimental music website, it must be true. 
In fact, they seem to be saying that the part of the album we recorded remotely is better than the part we re recorded in, in person, which is feels a little bit shady to me, but I'm going to accept it because it basically it's demonstrating you can perform music this way and, and um, maybe experimental music critics will like it. Maybe they'll like it better for some reason. Um, this is uh, a performance that we did for a concert series, um, sort of in those first two years of the pandemic. I thought maybe I'd just play a little bit of this because this one actually has video, unlike our album, which is just uh, recorded music. Uh, I'll, it's a long piece, so I'll play maybe the very beginning of it and then I'll skip it. This was also using Black Trip. Part of the our process does involve sort of like live sampling and then using those samples to build up harmonies and textures and such. Um, so it requires like having high quality audio if you're gonna build up a big sound cloud um, using this method. And it also requires a reasonable degree of low latency, waiting 15 seconds before your uh, collaborator can hear you. They've probably moved on to a completely different thought before end up doing their music. Just a little bit so you can get into some of the thicker textures that end up happening. So that's a performance we did using the same technology that was involved in the second half of the album. Um, I thought maybe I'd share just a couple uh, videos that we made that also kind of came out of all this research. Um, so as we were preparing to release this album, um, it's you know conventional to have um, some music videos to support uh, parts of your album uh, and. I had been doing so many of these remote performances and in particular performances where um, the audience could interact with the, the performers by sort of typing things into the, the chat window. That's a typical part of um, video streams. Um, 
that uh, we developed this idea of creating interactive music videos where uh, they would be running on Twitch as a, a live stream and where the audience could interact with the music videos by typing in specific commands. Um, so this is uh, one of our interactive videos. Uh, this is actually a live stream right now. So we could go to this on Twitch. <laughs> Uh, and you can see in the top left of the screen, there's a kind of vocabulary of commands that you can use uh, that will change how the music video is being presented. So, for example, the speed at which it's running. And it takes uh, about seven seconds because it's the internet. Possibly more than seven seconds. Okay, I'm going to check my box later on. So there's a there's a couple of these interactive videos that are running every possible recording.com. Uh, all right, that's the material that I came here to share with you. Uh, you can find out more about this project at congregationofdrones.com. The album and the interactive videos are on every possible recording.com. And I have time to uh, discuss, answer questions and such. Thank you. Of course, also congratulations on the recent release of this album. It's getting rave reviews, including that remote is obviously better. It's obviously better. <laughs> it's obviously. Yes. So if you have questions in Zoom, feel free to put them in chat or just um, Raise your hand and we'll unmute you if there's questions here for Jesse about what he shared, the technologies. Um, I mean, maybe one thing that I'm curious about, when you were working with Pauline remotely, I mean, maybe you've just performed together so long you don't need to. Um, did you come up with any strategies of collaboration because like you weren't going to have eye contact or like body gestures to follow? Or does that kind of fall in line with how you perform together anyway? It it was not, for us, it was not a huge change because I, the our performance strategy in general is, is based on listening and, and leaving a lot of room for um, someone to generate a new idea or to listen to textures that are already there. Um, so for the performance style that we were used to, uh, other than like a few practice sessions, we didn't have to come up with like a new philosophy or strategy for performing music. Um, other than maybe sort of because of the latency, I think there is a tendency to leave more space um, for the, the phrases to begin and end. Um, but that was about it. it. It didn't really change too much stylistically about how we were performing together. What about with Exploded? With Exploded Ensemble, um, there's just a huge difference between a remote performance that involves two people and anything more than the number two. Um, so once you begin to have three or four, or uh, yesterday we had 22 musicians who are performing in a network together, um, it's, uh, you, you quickly lose the ability to understand what sound is coming from where. So, uh, you know, when I'm performing remotely with Pauline, I know that either, I'm, I'm hearing either a sound that I made or a sound that Pauline made, but in a, a larger ensemble context like that, um, you're really like existing within a chaotic environment. Um, and also people have such a, a wide 
variety of bad internet um, in a situation like that, that there's a lot of like audio glitching, um, stutters and dropouts that you need to uh, learn to embrace as part of your sonic environment. So um, actually, I think for us, one of the things we could best do to prepare ourselves for that is just um, situating ourselves in a sort of deep listening practice of uh, listening to all sounds in your environment and trying to find something interesting that you can respond to from that. Um, so th that does feel like a very different approach, even though it's fundamentally using the same technology. Any other questions? I think we have none in the chat. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you for every, to everyone in this session. Thank you. Um, it's now the lunch break. There's not a formal lunch here, but you know, take snacks on your way. Uh, the session following lunch is um, celebrating Pittsburgh-based electronic music. Of course, with the CEE Toronto was so, so huge in in fostering them as young musicians and continuing to give them a home. And um, because we're based in Pittsburgh, I wanted to take this moment to celebrate. So come back for one fifteen when we'll uh, hear from some Pittsburgh musicians. Thanks. Awesome. Welcome back to our uh, first afternoon session. This is uh, our third of four sessions today. I think we have a lively, a lively group here. I'm looking forward to this. Um, so I'm going to introduce the moderator of this um, panel, which is communities of electronic music, focusing on things that have, have happened, might happen uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, so our moderator is Frida Abtan, who is a Canadian audiovisual composer and multidisciplinary artist with a keen interest in immersive media. Her music ranges from acousmatic composition to more industrial and pop influenced experimental performance. And of course, I am just so happy that she is my colleague here in the School of Music, uh, where she teaches electronic music composition. And we're so glad that you're here. You're still relatively new, but not that new anymore. So yeah, that's why we keep asking you to do stuff. Yeah. Anyways, I'm going to pass this over to her and uh, thank you in advance for sharing your experiences, your dreams, um, and of course, Lauren and Zoom Land. Thanks, Alexa. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. So um, we're just going to talk a little bit today about the Pittsburgh electronic music cu culture and community. And um, I was wondering if we could start just with everybody introducing themselves and talking about their area of interest and expertise. So I'm gonna, let's start in the real space. I'll pass the microphone down and then we can talk to you, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hello, my name's Anna Thompson and I'm co-artistic director of Slow Danger, which is a multidisciplinary performance entity based out of Pittsburgh. I've been living here since 2009. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it down to my co-artistic director over here to introduce. Hello, <laughs> my name is Taylor Knight. As uh, my partner Anna just mentioned, I'm also co-artistic director of Slow Danger, um, which they mentioned is a performance, multidisciplinary performance-based group here in Pittsburgh. Um, and I've been in Pittsburgh for 14 years. So happy to be here and thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Michael Johnson. Um, what do I say? Uh, I uh, design and build electronic instruments, um, perform with them. I also design electronic instruments for a living for a company based in Pittsburgh called Pittsburgh Modular Synthesizers uh, and have a life long involvement in the arts in Pittsburgh since I've been in Pittsburgh for my life, or most of my life. Thank you, Lauren. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Gashinsky. I am an audiovisual curator, um, and I currently live in New York. Um, I was in Pittsburgh forever. I, this was a, a COVID move, so I moved to Pittsburgh or moved to New York about a year and a half ago. Um, but I co-founded a festival in Pittsburgh called VIA, um, have been part of like the hot mass group for a long time. Um, I'm a DJ 
and also worked at Carnegie Mellon for a long time and did a lot of partnerships with the studio um, through VIA and a number of my other projects. And you also do a lot of activism. I do, um, especially during COVID. I was working really closely with local government and then um, like national initiatives like the National Independent Venue Association and then global initiatives um, with this group called Vibe Lab, which is out of Berlin, advocating for nightlife policies, um, funding and things like that. Amazing. So I was hoping that um, each of you could tell me a little bit about the culture in Pittsburgh that happens um, that sprung up around your interest. So let's start with you both, Slow Danger. Um, you both put on multimedia performances, but you also have like presence as musicians here. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the context that you do your work in town. And um, I'm not sure, do you ever do musical performances that are not a part of everything else? That are, maybe you could tell me a little bit about both. Yeah, um, first of all, I'd also like to say that VIA was a huge kind of reason that I feel like I got into making electronic music. Um, it made it like there were just incredible artists coming in and out of Pittsburgh during the time that VIA was happening and, and artists specifically like existing at this collision of like, as Golan used to say, like anti-disciplinary <laughs> um, work. And I think that just being able to be exposed to that work as I was getting out of college, as I was in a place of like questioning, I went to school for dance to a conservatory at Point Park University and had a lot of questions about like, what, why? Why are we moving our bodies this way? Why are we training this way? What's the point? Um, and also music was something that was always deeply um, lived alongside my dance practice, um, specifically electronic music. And so Taylor and I started to collaborate, making kind of more experimental ambient scores to our work. Um, and that became the entry point to the music community in Pittsburgh through friends that were in and around the VIA community, as well as like creating um, their own spaces such as Detour and, um, our friend Dario Michelli, who became our music manager for a while. And they would just offer little suggestions like, why don't you try a BPM? <laughs> why don't you try like, you know, to like mix these um, tracks that are isolated into each other and like create this cohesive set. Um, and then um, we also were able to perform that music live and have it kind of intersect with our dance practice. and. Um, I think what was really amazing that we started to see was like people from kind of what might seem to be isolated communities in Pittsburgh would then come to a dance class or come to a dance performance. Um, and it kind of created this um, addition. I don't know. I feel like kind of accessibility to dance that often feels like its own kind of um, scene in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you want to add more to that. Sure, yeah. Um, just echoing, and I also feel that the the VIA Festival and the programming that was happening there was something that drew me closer to wanting to, I used to kind of hide in my room with my music practice because I also am a dancer mostly by background um, and kind of carried, I guess, a bit of an imposter syndrome. I'm like, well, this I'm not going to show people this because I'm a dancer. <laughs> so I had to kind of come to terms with my own multidisciplinary artistry as well, but the VIA Festival would bring um, such an eclectic uh, programming um, and being able to go see artists that I was really, that really admired and getting to meet other folks in, the, in those communities. Um, Anna named our friend Dario Michelli, one of the first people that we started doing gear shares together, um, borrowing each other's stuff, him kind of just coaching me and helping me kind of figure out certain things around gear. I was one of the people that would buy gear and not read the manual and just plug it in and go. I've really leaned into that with Ableton and other gear that I've bought. Um, and as things progressed, uh, I think Ann and I had more kind of clear intentions on what we wanted to do with our music work, which led to needing to learn some new things about it. Um, and eventually leading to DJing also. And our friend Juan Augusto LaFontaine and Naeem are huge influences. Basically are kind of, in my opinion, DJ kind of grandparents that helped us um, find that 
practice together. Um, but I think being a performing artist and our dance work kind of living more in the performance art and experimental field, we easily came into some intersections with other folks who were curious about technology, sound making. Anna and I has always, have always seen our work in creating performances as world building, um, which led us to want to become more multidisciplinary together to build more entry points to the work that we were making. To me, music came as an extension of my dance practice. I started out as a tap dancer when I was like six. <laughs> but so the idea of vibration um, and percussive elements and just connecting to that sense of viscerality with somebody else um, has always been a motivator in the work that we make. And I feel like music or vibration is a direct connection point for a witness and a performer. Um, and I feel like the Pittsburgh community and the places, the sectors of those communities that I've had the privilege of being a part of um, seems overall very excited about the fact that we were dancers and trying to bring a multidisciplinary practice into the club, into the stages. We've had the privilege of performing at the VF Festival before as well. So there was a lot of folks that were able to also provide us opportunities to practice that. It's hard to practice performing unless you're performing in front of people. Um, so there was a sense of risk taking. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And um, just a quick question. I'm just wondering how you're finding the community, especially since the pandemic. Are you finding lots of opportunities to perform? Do you feel like there is a vibrant scene around you that's also doing different kinds of electronic music and multimedia work that you're part of? Or do you feel like um, actually you guys are sort of pioneering a local territory? How do you feel? Um, I think I feel that when the pandemic hit, we definitely most of our work was performing live. So obviously a lot of that was taken away. So we shifted more into trying to produce um, virtual or digital experiences. Um, we actually collaborated with a professor here, Robert Zacharias, in creating kind of a digital app platform that involved some original sound that we made and audience participation through facial tracking and things like that. Um, I feel like now I'm starting to feel that things are um, have been arriving back after the pandemic and more events and live performances are happening. But I think Anna and I just really dove into our sense of practice and our jamming practice together. I think pre-pandemic, we were focused a lot on meeting certain deadlines, kind of had this hustle pace that now looking back was unsustainable. So I think during the pandemic, we felt motivated to kind of demystify our own practice and lean into experimentation again. I feel like as part of the community, um, I feel like all of a sudden there's a generation of us who almost became like elders <laughs> within the pandemic. <laughs> I don't, it's like a, and I'm Taylor and I started to teach at Point Park University during that time and kind of introducing a whole new community of young people to the like other communities outside of their university. So it felt like all of a sudden what became like a community that we were all actively participating in. It's like we, some of us shifted into this place of being like, you know, initiators or like mentors. Um, and also I think that Taylor and I took a step back a little bit from performing so much and focusing more on like long-term visions for our work. Um, and it's exciting to see like a new generation enter the space, but I also, simultaneously feel like it's hard to convey what the community was before COVID to that generation. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, I'm like, oh, I guess I turned 30 in the pandemic. <laughs> kind of, um, yeah, interesting to be at that intersection. <laughs> okay, well, we'll resume this conversation yeah. in a minute. Michael, maybe I can call on you. Could you tell me a little bit about the kind of um, the context and community around electronic music instrument building and the kind of performance you do in Pittsburgh? Well, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm, maybe I'm trying to figure out what I was supposed to, how, how to answer a question like that. And I, I grew up in Pittsburgh and one thing I felt at a young age, uh, there were cool things to do when I was really little. Uh, there was a, a marionette theater that operated like a full-scale marionette there. I've been thinking about this recently, just over on Ellsworth, 
And it sort of like gave you the idea that inter these, these are like adults in Pittsburgh these days have a chip on their shoulder that they're not somewhere else. But I grew up with pretty neat things around me. It didn't occur to me I needed to go somewhere else to do interesting things, I guess. Um, and I grew up in an environment where people were making their own things. So like making your own instruments was OK. So was repairing your bicycle, or fixing your totally painting your own house. Uh, and um, by the 90s, when I was a young adult, um, we didn't like uh, the experimental film scene in Pittsburgh. So we started an experimental film series and um, met a lot of people. People came through town to do shows with us. And we were, I guess what I'm saying is those sorts of opportunities to do your own thing were easier to cultivate here, I think, than in a lot of other places. Like people from the so-called cultural centers would come to our place through town and say, gee, kind of sucks where we are because it's hard to do things. You know, mm -hmm. but you you gave you paid our plane ticket, you gave us two hundred dollars, put us up for a weekend and we had a great time. And nobody does that where we come from. You know, we get half that from MoMA and they don't pay travel. And it seems uh, like you're really discussing a kind of do it yourself attitude. Yeah, and I guess what I'm saying is I grew up in that kind of an environment yeah. and and so I sure there were limitations. It's a smaller town and there aren't, you know, ten thousand people who are interested in your little niches, but we were able to make quite a bit of interesting stuff for ourselves to happen. So it didn't really, we didn't feel a lack of something. I think that was a part of giving myself permission or getting permission from an environment to sort of keep doing something else. Is there a big community of people creating instruments in Pittsburgh? You know, I, it's awkward for me to answer questions like that because I'm not the most social person in the world. Mm -hmm. There are probably a bunch of people doing interesting things I don't know about, and it would be wrong for me to say that there are or aren't. So many reclusive genius. You no, know, I mean, I just mean I've never been the most social person sure. in the world. But I meet someone and they say I do this cool stuff, and I say, yeah, that does sound pretty cool, or, or maybe I'm not that interested in it. But I, I would never assume that I knew what was going on in town. You know. Um, what about in your networks? Do you feel like you're part of a community doing sure. this, or like maybe pioneering a community doing this? I would say I think that. Um, I sound evasive. I'm pretty sure I sound evasive, but um, I think there's been a lot of people interested in more sort of do-it-yourselfy kind of a things in general, whether it's building electronic instruments or um, knitting. Uh, sure. You know, then then there were maybe 20 years ago, say two decades ago, everybody was still thought everything in their life was going to pass through their computer. And people think that maybe a little bit less now, and I I like that because uh, it there's more fresh air on it. <laughs> and I'm just gonna before we turn the tables to Lauren, I'm just gonna ask really quickly um, because your professional life at Pittsburgh Modular right. does connect you with DIY makers probably all over the country and beyond. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that's something. Um, like in a sense, your community might be larger and more well, sure. Yeah, I think that's a part of like I'm probably became an adult a couple of times uh, in my lifetime. So maybe I haven't gotten there yet. But um, no, I, I I do. There there are these effects where you think, well, there are things that I have to go somewhere else to do. I I went somewhere else and did some things because I couldn't do them here. Um, but it is true that. There's like a, an international, you're more connected to people internationally than I, I used to be. And a part of that is through the work that I do because we sell things to people in Japan and mm -hmm. Australia and Europe and all over the place. And I sometimes get to go to those places. And even if I don't get to go to those places, um, you know, they write you from Estonia and say they like the thing that you designed and they find it a useful tool. And whether that directly nourishes your work, it maybe it doesn't, but it makes you feel good you know, which Definitely. is nourishing. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess. And then I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any involvement in any of the maker spaces or? Um... Well, I, I, not directly. I mean, occasionally, I guess, is the answer. I mean, I've done a lot, a lot of teach. I've probably, the thing I've done for a living more than anything else is teaching. I've taught now for over 25 years. 
Um, and most of it has been the young people teaching them how to make things. Uh, it used to be filmmaking. These days, it's mostly about building electronics. And sometimes it's in these sort of newly formed independent spaces or for public schools or programs like that, almost never for credit. Um, and I, I like all of, I, there's, I haven't met a DIY space I didn't like, but um, they almost all, you know, die in seven years. Okay. Are there, <laughs> since the pandemic, maybe I can And that's not a thing. bad thing necessarily, as long as something else happens afterward, you know, sure. like uh, a dead tree is good nourishment for a new tree. I think that's a great attitude. Have you found that since the pandemic, there's a lot of these spaces have managed to make it or are opening up again? Probably. Yeah, I hope so. But I, I don't I don't know for sure. I mean, I like I like what I see, but lately I don't I haven't been there. <laughs> Just the truth. Thank you. Lauren, maybe I can turn to you now. Could you tell me a little bit about the electronic music context for the work you were doing in Pittsburgh and what the community looks like? Yeah, sure. Oh my, there's so, there's so many like full circle connections here. I've been like making a mental note of some of the things y'all said. Um, but I, maybe I'll start with like a timeline just so folks that aren't familiar can kind of fit all these pieces together. But um, I moved to Pittsburgh when I was 12, um, just to go back a minute. And like, you know, I moved from more of like an urban setting in New Jersey to a cul-de-sac like outside of Pittsburgh. So from the minute I got to Pittsburgh, I was like, what else is out there? Like I felt extremely isolated and that kind of, that persisted for a long time. Um, and in college, you know, I was studying art history and fine arts, but there was always two sides of me, like in my interests, I was always interested in the visual arts and particularly like digital media and performance. And then you know, that connects very much to music. Um, and similarly, I had this like constant world building itch, um, you know, where I, I was always focusing on like, or imagining like these networks of performances or people or scenes or just ways to, you know, ways to create like rhizomatic experiences. Um, and when I was out of college, you know, I worked in nonprofit arts, and then I was working at CMU in the School of Art. Um, and this kind of fantasy sort of gelled in terms of creating VIA. And I created it with um, a guy that was my partner at the time. And the way we started it was through collaborating with other music crews and very intentional collaborations with small and large institutions in Pittsburgh. And my goal was like to get this very intentional cross breeze going. Um, and that iterated from 2010 to 2017. Um, technically 2018. And so we had a festival every year, um, which not only like made every year new links between different seasons in Pittsburgh, but was bringing in artists from all over the world um, and kind of just the collaborations kept scaling, right? And they kept changing every year. And that was something I really loved about it um, and something like I'm still trying to do in my work. And so I felt like it was a pretty mutual like learning process. I mean, kind of like to Michael's point, I feel like every couple years I have to grow up again or I'm growing up again. And it's often through, you know, I set out to try to do something that I don't know how to do. <laughs> and I'm doing it with a lot of people. So it can get like, it can get wild at times. Um, but, you know, VIA was really to create something that just wasn't there before. And so that DIY mentality was kind of baked into me from the moment I moved to Pittsburgh, like as a kid. Um, and there are blessings and challenges in that. You know, I would say the blessings are yes, like the bar, and I'm hoping it's still, you know, lower, like for entry to be able to pilot things and try stuff out. But I will say that there is like, to my understanding, and a big reason why I had to move was that there was a big gap um, in terms of like professional development. You know, there's still, I think, this huge gap between DIY endeavors and like really established institutions. And I found myself for a good period of time like stuck in the middle where I just could not like you know level up in the way that I really wanted to and doing these kind of events like the reality of it is that it's it's really financially difficult um and that's just the real talk of it so there are incredible experiences um and in Pittsburgh you can definitely like take a lot of chances but you know there's a lot of risk involved so I hope that gives you like a bit of the, the lay of the land 
um Absolutely. yeah i don't so, know i can pause there for a minute if we want to like pause on that and come back to other things or if you'd like me to talk about anything else right now well i think i'd like to add just something to, to what you said um you know the legacy of the via festival is still very much ongoing so not only have we for instance just heard from slow danger what a huge influence it was and in impact on their artistic development but I know myself when I was checking out Pittsburgh to decide if I could move here and take a job here, the first thing I found online based on my search terms was the VIA Festival. So even if it's not happening, there's it's added to sort of a legacy in the artistic community. It's definitely ongoing, but this wraps really nicely into a different question that I have for you. So maybe we can continue there. Um, I think at CMU, we're really interested in hearing um, what you think the role of the institution is in the electronic music community here and how you think that CMU can help that community grow. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that this is something that really crosses over with your area of expertise and interest. Maybe you could give us some thoughts on that. Definitely. Um, I mean, when I when I was living in Pittsburgh and I still have this mentality that I call it just Robin Hooding, like I would look at situations, whether it was a, an empty building or kind of maybe a gap in a connection between larger institutions with resources and like really small communities. I was like, how am I going to Robin Hood this thing? Like, how am I going to make a match between these things to give accessibility and to like, you know, advance all of us? Um, and huge props to go on Levin because I like, you know, while I was working at CMU, I approached the studio, like, you know, with no shame. And I was like, I want to be a fellow here. Like I do this work anyway. I was kind of, um, informally, you know, giving internships to tons of students through via, um, people were getting like their first chances at shows through via, and I deeply enjoyed it. But at the same time, I was like, this is really valuable, you know, and why as like an independent curator, am I not acknowledged for this? So, you know, I went to Golan and I was like, hey, I'm doing this work and I've done a couple events with the studio. Like I would I would really love to be considered a fellow and do like consistent work with you. And at first he was like, I don't think staff can be fellows. And I was like, well, why not? I'm a researcher, I'm a producer you know and so like we made that work and i don't i don't want to like lay claim to be like i was the first staff fellow at the studio but i think it's like pretty true and that changed my my whole trajectory i mean i was able to do you know i was able to pull together academic programs and also sort of formalize with also folks like larry shea like who we ended up having like a multi-year relationship through via with his first year grad students like that really changed things for me and i think it changed things for a lot of other people. Um, there's an artist, Kevin Ramser, that now lives out in LA. He started with Via in 2010, like right out of undergrad doing video documentation and ended up going to CMU for grad school in Larry's program because of his portfolio with Via, continued to create like incredible audiovisual performances and you know now has moved on in his career to LA. So just that pathway, I think, those partnerships, those intentional partnerships are invaluable. That's really interesting because it sounds like in some sense you're advocating for an expanded uh, vision of what it means to be an academic researcher. In Definitely. Academy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's great. I would love to hear if you have any more thoughts on that. I personally I, I feel um, and I'm sure most of us feel like arts organizers are like the secret to the universe, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> the people who often make our shows happen and, and help seed that community. So I, I like the idea of that being something that's taken really seriously in the academy, that's like understood and supported. Um, and it's really nice to hear that, that, that you were able to find that partnership. Yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. I'm, I'm like forever grateful to go on and, and Larry. Um, and there's a lot of other folks that I can mention too. I mean, they're like Susie Silver, like, you know, there's, Angela Washko, who came in, like, and we're peers, too, you know, so I think there's also this, this energy, even just with peers that I found really, really strong. What I will say is that, like, in 2017, I moved on to another job in Pittsburgh. And I noticed that when I didn't work there, um, it, it was harder to keep those connections, because I wasn't like in people's face every day, right. And also access 
was different because there was a harder justification um, to keep me as a fellow if I wasn't directly affiliated with CMU. So is part of a vision maybe that you would have in terms of how CMU could sort of support the local electronic music culture around us, maybe to sort of advocate for more, like bringing or cultural organizers in as fellows to make those bridges? Of or course. Do you think there's other ways we could advocate in the community? Of course. I mean, it's sharing access and resources, straight up. That can look a lot of different ways, but that's like the, the bottom line. Before I let you go, I'm just going to ask a little bit because you've done so much advocacy for nightlife inside the city. And of course, there are other institutions in Pittsburgh besides CMU that we want to um, hear from that are also really Im important um, potential for building more electronic music culture in Pittsburgh. And I'm just wondering um, if you see any like strong allies there. Could you say that again? Sorry, help me. With I think I got a little glitch. I miss having a question in there. So I'm very sorry. Sorry, my bad. Also, like things kind of my I don't know if I like lost connection for half a second, but say it again. Well, I'm just wondering, like, OK, so you were very involved in um, I know you were on some boards advising the city about nightlife in Pittsburgh. Is that right? Yeah. So during COVID, I it, me and a, and a handful of people like uh, Liz Berlin from Mr. Smalls, Adam Valen from Drusky. I mean, there's a lot of people in the background. Like when COVID hit, it it became like a move of survival to be like, we need to talk a lot more with the city about how we are not going to let this infrastructure completely crumble. Um, and thus like have, you know, an entire, <laughs> like an entire ecosystem like disappear permanently. Um, so we started talking a lot more closely with Allison Harnden from the mayor's office. She There's an office of nighttime economy. Mm -hmm. um, cities in around the United States are starting to adopt this, especially since COVID. And oftentimes it's really focused on like food and beverage industry. Um, and so I was coming from the angle and Liz and all these other folks like, look, the economics of how the night works and like how essential it is to cities is you can't separate it from the culture that's happening. And there just has to be different ways of doing this. Um, and that's like the high level, but um, it, it involved policy, it involved, it involved funding, safety, all sorts of things. And is there still like, do you know if there's still sort of ongoing, um, is there still ongoing consulting with a lot of the nightlife organizations in Pittsburgh? Um, yeah. The government, or was that just post pandemic? No, I mean, it, what happened during COVID in Pittsburgh and similarly in other cities um, is still growing and it's, it still has legs and it's still relevant. Um, all of the concerns during COVID were just like highly amplified versions of problems that always existed and still do. Um, and so I would say like talk to Liz Berlin um, if you want to get like a deeper look into how folks are still working with the city, you know, to, get, to do advocacy. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to turn back to you guys, Anna and Taylor. Um, I'm really interested in hearing about how you feel, like what you feel the role of institutions are in the kind of art community of Pittsburgh and the electronic music culture in Pittsburgh, because um, I know that both of you have worked like quite a lot in different festival events here. You obviously feel like VIA supported your development a lot, which is fantastic. Um, how do you see the, inst in the intersection playing out of these sort of big cultural institutions in Pittsburgh and the art that you care about? Yeah, I think someone coming from a dance background um, that came into the kind of DIY or um, musical um, community, I think dance kind of is really hard to exist without institution but because it requires very specific spaces for it to occur. So I think that we came into this community really seeing, you know, similarly, I think to what Lauren just said, like, how can we kind of disrupt some of these institutions? Um, and I think that's been, you know, I think there's a lot more barrier barriers for folks that are not white to do that. Um, and we are two white people who are able to 
make relationships with some of these institutions and very directly go up and be like, I want to do this here. Will you support this? You're also two white people who teach and have like the approval, the yeah. official approval of institutions. Right. And I think also kind of being the, the, the birds that we are of like bringing dance <laughs> into a museum space but there's also club music happening <laughs> you know it's like but we're also it's like we kind of are able to kind of be like we've got this high art thing going on but we're also going to try to like bring in like intersections to these events and that's quite literally how we were able to get a residency as performers at the Carnegie Museum of Art we were just like hey we've been doing events for the last couple of years they've been pretty successful Maybe we could do a long-term partnership over a period of like half a year and we can do events and interventions in the museum and also hold these like nightlife events. Um, we went up to the Warhol and we're like, hey, we wanna do, you know, it's like, I think that's also what's been nice about Pittsburgh too, is that kind of like, there's a circularity to the community because all of the communities are so small. It's like impossible to kind of exist in the, total isolation of one of them. Um, so I, for us also being people that rely on the foundational funding to produce our work, um, it's been vital for our existence as artists. And we've tried to advocate for other artists, especially artists that are, you know, from perhaps more of the club space that don't see that institution as something that they is accessible to them. And I, I think the foundations, particularly like the Pittsburgh Foundation and Heinz Endowments are now, because of artists like Lauren and artists in our community that have shown that like, these are community cultural spaces or it's not just, we're getting fucked up and having a good time. It's also happening. But these are like, in, these are cultural forms and they should be supported. Um, so I, for me, like the role, observing the role of the institution is like, you have the resources, you have the money, first of all, to support this. Let's do it. Um, and and I, sometimes I, it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> I think also being media artists, that takes more money than some other forms of art and more gear than some other forms of art. So um, for sure, intersecting with different institutions often gives you access to spaces that are already set up to be able to do that work in. Do you feel like you're able to bring that kind of work into the more sort of DIY sectors of the community? Like, do you still, if you perform, when you perform at say an underground music event, which I'm gonna assume you guys do a lot, um, do you feel like you can do your sort of like uh, media rich work there? Do you have a kind of re reduced version of your performance that you can do in spaces that aren't so technically laid out? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've done a lot of kind of car touring with our work, as you said, in underground venues all the way to the more kind of museum institution type of venues. And I think, I mean, as artists, we we have to adapt to those environments. You know, we're trying to create this world or this experience for the participants or the viewers. Um, so there's not always as many resources available to like hang the LED light sculpture that interacts with us and tracks our body through space and like triggers the audio in Ableton. And then like the way we breathe is gonna affect like how the light swells and doesn't like, we can't always go into that work just because it's not, the resources maybe aren't there or that's not the, the space doesn't have that capability. So I think Anna and I try to lean heavily into, you know, I think of the, I often think of water as something that you can pour into so many different shaped containers and it's always gonna find its way to fill that container and still be that substance. Um, and that's something that we take into our work where we try to distill the intention of what our experience or what we're trying to extend down to simpler forms. What is the one question or the one image or the one thing that we really are trying to extend to the audience, um, especially if we have to like pare it down or make it smaller. But I think, the spirit of like collaboration and in DIY spaces, I've often felt that people want to come together to make the vision possible. I almost prefer sometimes utilizing those experiences in DIY venues because there is this more 
intentional spirit of collaboration. And I think that word collaboration gets thrown around a lot. Like we're an institution collaborating with these artists. Like, I don't think they're really collaborating. I think it's like checking some boxes and like showing something, you know, it's like transactional more so. Um, and I think the biggest thing to also answer the question of like, how do you navigate performing in these different venues? I think Lauren really hit the nail on the head with there's just this huge gap from being like an emerging artist to being established. Um, but I have seen some things like I know the Carnegie Library networks have like you can go in and try gear out and rent gear and do things like that. I think that's an amazing resource for people who may not have access. Um, but yeah, I think it's our role as artists to still try to make the vision or the intention of the work as vibrant as we can, whether we're in a smelly garage space, which we've done quite often, which I also love, or or we're in a space that has the grid and is able to install all the all the things. So I think we take that responsibility to still try to fulfill the vision. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Michael, I'm just wondering if you could maybe take a pass at some of these same questions about um, the community around you in Pittsburgh. Like, um, do you see, I mean, you've talked already a little bit about the fact that you think there's a large DIY culture here. There are spaces that are continuously springing up and disbanding and doing new things. And I'm just wondering how you see, um, do you see, like, how you see that people filtering in? Like, first of all, like, is it, you know, these days people start in school, they might start programming early, they might start um, building things early. Yeah. How do they get involved and organize their own um, cultural spaces and learn about building things? Well, I, don't, I think they have to want to, or they have to be exposed to something that helps them feel like it's okay to do that. When I was in high school, I listened to WRCT on the radio, uh, the CMU College Radio Station, for those who don't know it. Um, and uh, it made a lot of weird music seem all right to me, things that were um, really sort of maybe morally questionable and um, uh, things that involve, you know, stealing or, you know, a lot of profanity or really, uh, I guess what I'm saying is uh, it was an exposure to a lot of things that a young person thinks that they're not sure is all right because nobody in school told them it was all right. Um, and those exposures are important to making you feel like you're not alone, having some opportunity to create some thing where you and your friends get together and make weird music or um, uh, start a publication or something like that. They are possible in smaller towns. Doesn't necessarily mean that Pittsburgh has the strongest DIY scene in the world, but I think Pittsburgh is a place that is potentially fertile for those things like you know, the Tigris and Euphrates were a great place to start a civilization. Mm. Doesn't mean that there had to be a great civilization started there. And few synthesizers. Right, and not very many synthesizers. That could change. Um, Silicon Valley, that's not where the silicon came from. <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> the word mind in the valley. It's like, um, what is that? Hidden Valley Ranch dressing. It doesn't actually come from there. Um, no, but uh, I guess, but there is this thing, and I think some of us are sort of touching on it in different directions, like the role of the institution versus the role of the grassroots or something, and how there's some big gap between them. I don't, I don't know if institutions have to play a role. I feel like the current situation is that there are like a whole bunch of economies that coexist, and one of them is the institutional economy, where people get paid, they get paid for a living to, to do the arts. I know a bunch of people who work in arts institutions. I've worked in arts institutions. Uh, they get a salary for a while. They get to put on shows for a living as opposed to the people who did it in their spare time. And you can say, well, that's necessary. I don't know if it's necessary. It's cool if it happens. It, there's often a bargain with them. You know, you're like, what, whose ass did you have to kiss in what way in order for this to happen or whatever? Those those are real trade-offs. They are, although I have to say that my experience is that it's more of a continuum because I see a lot of people who've been doing this their whole life for free and yeah. get PhDs in it and then finally get paid for it and then help train other people to do it. Yeah, no, that's so absolutely it, true too. But I, I, I don't think it, it has to... The, culture can happen in a bunch of different ways and sometimes big institutions are... Um, even when they're well funded to do good things, aren't necessarily the best things that are happening in a, sure. in a town. 
Um, and, uh, oh, you know, like a postcard is as good as a, as a billboard a lot of the time too, because it, you know, gets around more easily. We did a lot more subversive uh, artwork by putting posters on telephone poles than, we, than you know, getting on Radio France or. Well, one of the things that I, I'm really interested in that that you were saying is that actually you feel like, for instance, when you were talking about CMU's um, student-run radio station, yeah, playing things that were a little bit more culturally subversive and letting you know you weren't alone as an artist. I mean, there's some institutional support there, but there's some. Probably what's unique about that, about that kind of radio station model is that the institution isn't deciding what's being aired on it. Well, the institution basically right? gave a transmitter to a bunch of kids who exactly. uh, were left alone to do what they wanted until they accidentally put a curse word on the air. And then the, uh, you know, and then the FCC came down on them for a while, and then they go through that cycle again. But yeah, no, it was, you're right, it was whatever, a safe space for weird culture in today's so would you say that one of the things that institutions could do to sort of support emerging arts culture and DIY arts culture, like arts culture that is fundamentally artist organized and established is just make more spaces for people to be weird? Like, you know what I mean? Ma enable, enable places where other people can fill in the content, where artists can come and do their thing rather than your thing. Sure. How could you how could you argue against it? It's I would never <laughs> argue against it. It's a difficult position to take. Can I jump in on that one? Can oh, I jump please, in jump in. Oh, I'm so Her sorry. You had the little hand up and I didn't even see it. Please. Um, okay. Just all right, lots of thoughts here. Like to your question of like, oh, should the institution make spaces for artists to be weird? No. Like the artists and like independent organizers are doing that themselves. If institutions want to truly partner and like share resources that then have like the equal amount of ROI, <laughs> like what these artists and organizers will get out of it is the same amount of value as an institution, then sure, like partner up. If you want to invest in a space that is like co owned with people in the community, that's a good start. Things like that. Not that the institution, created more real estate or things that, that's in their control that they can say, well, here, now you have a space for this, but that person has absolutely no investment in that or any return other than like doing programming. And that's not sustainable. So I would just go a little bit wider on that Maybe question. Maybe we can back up and just unpack what you said. I'm not sure I completely followed it. Is that all right? Sure. And also just like from what I said, like I see some nodding with like Anna and stuff. Um, do y'all do y'all kind of know what I'm getting at here? Do you want to maybe help like jump in on that? Yeah, thought? totally. I think that it's like what I picked up from what you offered is like the artists are already doing that. So like give the artists the reins in some ways and not just by like giving them a night to throw a show. You know, it's like how do we kind of empower I don't like how does the institution actually support a what's already happening and I think that from some from my artistic perspective sometimes I feel like I have to put on a different mask when I'm interfacing with the institution um, and what is expected versus like what I might actually want to do artistically um, and they're kind of like almost resourcing the community for what they want it to be, as opposed to offering, like creating an opportunity for this, um, what's already happening to kind of continue developing. Um, and I, I like, um, yeah. I think that's the end of my thought right now. <laughs> and let me just maybe go through it again and back it up because what I'm saying, like the economics of this, like it is extremely hard, if almost impossible, to be an independent artist or organizer and make your living off of that, right? Um, and when we think about where and how these things happen, I mean, we do not have the granting system that Canada or Europe has, especially um, in the field of like where the gallery meets the club, which is, you know, where Slow Danger exists, it's where VIA exists, it's where a lot of progressive artists exist that wear, you know, a number of different hats. 
because there's not like a substantial granting system that can give someone like a full living, there's like other economics at play, especially in Pittsburgh and also a place that's like continuing to like rapidly gentrify is like, think about the spaces in which these things happen. If they only happen on university property that's owned by a university, the real value is in that real estate and the amount of grants that a university can attract. That's like completely, like it's night and day to what an individual artist or organizer could could attract in terms of like resources. So, you know, and I think about spaces out in the community, like there's different forms of ownership that would give artists, you know, actual like long-term potentially long-term financial stability and they would reap what they sowed in a positive way that like the the creative contributions that they are giving to a space come back to them in the increasing value of that real estate or the ability to attract larger grants you know in the case of if the university created a space the university holds the assets and they hold the money and access to that from in most of the cases so you know that that's just like money talk but i think it's real and i think it it's about ownership and it's about like long-term sustainability that's really interesting thank you i apologize because i think we're probably i'm gonna ask you guys all one more question before i turn the microphone to the floor and take some questions from the audience um I would love to hear about one of your, re what you're up to now, um, a current project and a current project that intersects with Pittsburgh, ideally. Um, Taylor and myself are working on a, like, I think when I said earlier, we're, we were taking a step back. It's because we were gigging at an astronomical rate and hadn't, we're so burnt out and so unable to like, feel like we had a uh, like agency over the kind of work we wanted to do. So we have been kind of scaling back to consider like what long-term kind of works do we want to make? And that requires energy as capital. <laughs> so it required us to take a step back from like continuously gigging um, in the community. And this project that we've been working on is part of a trilogy of queer science fiction, multidisciplinary, um, performance works um, called Supercell, where we um, kind of explore an apocalyptic climate event um, that is also like tied into the way that we consume um, catastrophe as a society. Um, and it's a quintet work with um, several other dancers, an actor and playwright, um, a scenic designer um, who's building a kind of immersive performance world with us um, and an advisory committee of intersectional participants that come from education, come from public health, come from a scientific or a sustainable design background that we kind of meet with throughout the process and kind of reflect the ideas back and build community in that way, as well as like sharing open level movement workshops where we offer the embodied prompts and work that we're doing in the studio to our community. And that will premiere at the end of 2023 with Kelly Strayhorn Theater as our local partner in the University of Maryland as um, an additional kind of commissioner um, and tour um, through a support provided by the National Performance Network and the National Dance Project. Woo! You can add more. Yeah, another project that has kind of been ongoing and that I'm looking forward to is kind of just related to our teaching practice. Since we have such a strong dance background, we're often brought into dance festivals and dance programming to teach. And there's a lot of folks who might identify as dancers who want to make music, and they, but they don't feel like they know how to enter that. So we've been able to travel with our little drum machines and our gear and be able to be in dance studio spaces or other kind of DIY movement spaces and get to work with dance practitioners and give, you know, kind of build labs for them to experiment and make their own music. So a project I'm really excited about is we just taught at a festival in Seattle, where we set up a couple of music gear stations and we just let them go and we recorded everything for them. So I'm trying to mix all that together and make like show them their raw track and that they're really excited about the fact that they made um, a sound score. So just showing 
that dancers can also kind of cross that bridge into wanting to create other work is or other work through other disciplines is exciting for me to continue. Michael, how about you? Oh, uh, what am I doing? I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, what Bernard von Brown said, uh, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. Um, uh, what am I doing? I, uh, I Hopefully I'll get back to teaching soon because I haven't been teaching in the last several years. That would be great. Um, I'm preparing. Um, Cunningham Dance Company for their licensing. Well, the Cunningham Dance Company is officially the trust, yes. Uh, but anyway, it's it's for them for one of the licensed pieces. Um, and um, I did a, a whole mess of performances over the summer in France and Germany, uh, realizing uh, some of David Tudor's very difficult early work, um, uh, which came out of um, research directly into his instruments and hopefully there's um, some fallout from that if that's the right word. It really isn't the right word um, uh, to come. Uh, I don't know if that fallout's local though. Fallout tends to, it's the nature of fallout that you never know where it's gonna fall. Uh, but anyway, yeah. That's great. How about you, Lauren? What do I have going on that connects to Pittsburgh? Yeah, I mean, if you have nothing that, connects to Pittsburgh at the moment, you can just tell us what you're up to. But, uh, I will always be connected to Pittsburgh. Number one, my mom lives there. I think she'll always live there. I come back like pretty regularly. Um, but a couple things, like just anywhere I've gone, I've like always brought Pittsburgh with me. And I don't know if even, I, that's like some reptilian part of me <laughs> that like just does it. Um, but you know, back when I was, this was um, after I worked at CMU and in Pittsburgh, like right before COVID, for about a year and a half, I lived in Vancouver and ran a festival there called New Forms. But I brought Pittsburgh with me there. Like I brought um, the Honcho Collective out um, and they were part of this larger festival program. Um, I have, you know, in New York, I have different platforms. I have a residency on the lot radio. Um, I have a residency at Public Records. And I have other places where like, I'm kind of continuously trying to figure out that infinity flow between you know how would I bring folks out to Pittsburgh and hopefully folks will bring me back. Um, and I think that that transference is really important. Um, so I wouldn't want people to think that I'm I'm not present, right? But I think people have to kind of create that that loop for each other. Um, and then I'm on the board of resident advisor. So if folks are familiar with resident advisor, it's actually turning 21 this year. It's like the oldest largest electronic music discovery platform on the web finally drink yeah i can finally drink we're gonna have a big party <laughs> it's just like that was the joke i made too michael i made that joke too and people didn't think it was that funny <laughs> no. no because right. in in europe they can drink yeah no i know it's a very american haha but yeah we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna rage but um no it's a great platform and you know, in Pittsburgh, just to take this full circle, like when I was starting events a long time ago to be on resident advisor, even to get editorial or be featured was huge because you would get visibility like all over the world. Um, and so now to be on their board and like being able to advocate for, you know, I'm, I'm really focused on like the Americas, but, you know, really to dive in and focus and advocate for like US culture, like, means a lot to me and in the sense that it's also a huge responsibility and like Pittsburgh is always in my conversations with them and like also scenes that are not on the coast right like there's so much electronic music history like throughout the Midwest if you want to know like where acid came from that's in like a corn tower in Kansas like you know there's <laughs> if you want to talk about electronic music culture and how where cer certain parts of it started um, in the U.S. and kind of how how that's evolved over time, you know, there's so much that's happened outside of major cities and Pittsburgh is a huge part of that story. So from like the most cheeky, whatever, like fact tidbit, like where acid comes from versus like really like <laughs> techno came from Detroit, right? You know, there's 
there's a lot of, of advocating that I do that always brings Pittsburgh back into the mix. So yeah, I think we're gonna always have a relationship. That's great, thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Um, at this point, I think that uh, we have a little bit of time if anybody wants to ask some questions to our panel participants. Maybe you guys take that one. Hi, so I just wanna say, I found this whole discussion fascinating and honestly really valuable because I feel like I'm going through um, a lot of the same, thinking about a lot of the same questions as you all in that I, I study computer science and music at CMU, I'm a senior now. I frequently intersect with many of the Pittsburgh DIY spaces. I can say that they are alive and well. And I've always found it really funny that considering, so I make experimental electronic music with computer science, which using live coding, which is itself a very, very academic environment, or at least the tool, that's where the tools emerge from. So it feels like this perfect storm of, oh, I'm at the intersection of arts and technology. I like, I'm adjacent to so many buzzwords, whereas I've been so consistently inspired by all the stuff happening in the DIY scene and not at all at, or very minimally by this stuff actually at CMU, the institution. It just feels like there is not no very clear connection between what the institution does and how like arts and culture actually evolve in the city. And I was wondering if that was at all different in your experiences when you were <clears throat> in my position, like as a student kind of finding your own, you know, expression, developing a voice. I, I can just be brief with mine. I'm, I went to a conservatory for dance. So mine is mostly related to being a dance performer, but also growing an interest in creating sound and music within my undergrad. And I would say that my institution was not really interested in me wanting to pursue experimental forms. Um, they were interested in me going and achieving a goal that would look really nice on their brochure to attract other students to come and wanna to go to that school because so-and-so made it here, there, and vice versa. Um, so, but being in the institution, I was able to meet peers as well as faculty that was working that on the low were kind of like, oh, I'm interested in that too. Um, so I met a teacher there, Pearl Ann Porter, who runs this, what I would refer to as a pretty much DIY type of space called the Space Upstairs. Um, so through that, I met some people that were doing the weird stuff that I was interested in doing and, and finding that, but I don't think the institution that I went to at large was interested in my pursuit of that. And I think the irony of it is they asked us to come back and teach there <laughs> after we made our careers in doing the thing that they told us not to do. So I think it's also like, you know, I believe institutions play a role in supporting the arts, but I also, you know, we, we have to know the limits of their capacity at times. And like often I have to, you know, it's like not put as much value on what is valuable to them at that present moment if there are other communities that are calling to you. Um, and who knows, maybe it'll come back around and ring the bell, you know? <laughs> I, I'd like to add a quick thought on this, um, maybe just from the other side as a professor. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm a professor who also had a pretty active art practice and went through my own institutional training. And not all of the work that I did was directly supported by my classes. And I think you'll find that that's always the case if you're doing new things because it takes a while for the institutions to catch up. But as an artist, I do have to say that I've had some very good teachers through institutions and the skills I got from them have still carried into my work. And I hope that as a professor, my students would say that one, whether or not I understand their art, I'm pushing for them to make it. And two, I am trying to give them insight and skills that will help them to be themselves, to be the kind of artist they wanna be. So. Personally, I really don't see that institutions and the sort of art community are at any kinds of odds with each other other than that they have some slightly different goals. 
which is specifically in terms of educational institutions, the goal really is to help you get there. It's not, it's not to be there. You know what I mean? Like we're so focused on trying to give students what it is that they're gonna need to succeed without actually knowing who they are to, to do it and trying to give um, curriculum that's gonna help as many people as possible. And of course, all the best freaks are gonna be a little bit freaky and so slightly left of what that is. But ideally, we're giving them some skills that will be transferable into their own art practice. So I am very interested in like the intersection of these different like contexts. And especially um, I'm personally very, very invested in how, um, in how CMU can help be part of the electronic music scene around us and intersect with it in all kinds of ways. But I am hoping that one of the ways we intersect with it is by making astounding musicians who go off and do really cool things. And I think that's part of the nature of being an education institution. But it's a great question. Can I add, since I've spent a lot of time in and around teaching and also on the, like parasitically involved in education, using libraries I had no right to use, um, that uh, use what you can wherever you find it. You know, like uh, one thing that institutions can give you that nobody else really can very well is a certain kind of an intellectual rigor. You know, they'll, uh, you have the opportunity to be forced to learn things you don't want to learn because you don't think you need to learn them and they'll help you be better at other things. And it's okay to tie your hands behind your back and do those things for a while because you won't necessarily force yourself to do them later. I taught myself how to, I taught myself electronics to do the things that I thought I was interested in. But when I started doing it professionally, I had to do the things I didn't want to do. So I had to design power supplies, which I despised, but I got good at designing power supplies because it was a part of the intellectual rigor of my, my work. And that was, and had I gone to school for electrical engineering, I might've bothered to learn power supply design at that time. So use what you can wherever you find it. Don't expect, uh, go to a whole bunch of different mountains. You know, um, people who are people who have big minds and are interested in a lot of things are going to take influences from just about everywhere. You have, you know, you don't like what mom says, go ask dad. And um, you know, uh, well, people well, maybe Warhol's a bad example, but um, he knew how to hang around with rich people. He knew how to hang around with institutions, and he also loved to read dirty pornography. You know, that was a part of what influenced him and, and it informed his work. And it was what made his work rich and interesting was because it didn't come from just one place. Because he wasn't just a, a dumb kid who was interested in dirty porn. He was a smart kid who was interested in dirty porn. I no, I mean, that many. matters. That's a, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's because you have a, a kind of an unusual, weird way of looking at the world that you start to do interesting work. And you can say, well, everything I really learned, I didn't, I hated my teachers. Well, Sometimes the teacher you hated really helped you become the person you are. Rauschenberg always talked about Joseph Albers and Albers was kind of a bastard. Mm -hmm. But he, but his experience with Albers, he said, I didn't agree with anything Albers said. Um, he was a tyrant, but he constantly talked about him as if it was the most important person in his life. So, I mean, I'm not saying that all bad experience is actually good experience, but it, it helps to inform you. Could I just jump in on, on that question just very briefly? This my my answer to that question goes to the to the faculty and I don't I can't see who's in the room or anything. But what I would say is that it's like incumbent on faculty to live both in and outside of an institution. And so you need to get to know the scene in Pittsburgh or in any communities that students like that you want to connect your students to. But in doing that, like I I implore you like when you go out into like outside of university walls and you're connecting with experts like in the community don't just expect free advice because that's like an access and currency that is actually very valuable and like i've given so much free advice and i've seen other people give a ton of free advice and access and then just get their backs walked on and people kind of take things that are theirs or that they were very instrumental in creating and so I would just say to faculty, like when you're reaching out and under looking at who's in your community and you want advice from them, like ask them what they need. Someone might say to you like, well, I have a consultation fee. 
So if you want to know all these things, like, here's my fee. Other people might say, I actually would really love access to your mocap studio. Like, is there any way that we can do a trade? Other folks might say, um, I am really intrigued by the research going on in the studio. Like, can I talk to you about being a fellow or like, if we work together, could I get access to grants that on my own, I can't get access to. So whatever that is, like when you approach people and get to know like where you're at, like, please think of it both ways. Okay, thank you so much. I think at this point we have probably run out of time, but I'd really like to thank our panel participants who are all so excellent sharing their viewpoints. Very appreciated. Welcome to the last session. Uh, another panel, but this time we're bringing it back to the whole reason that we gathered here in the CE, the CE 50. So Paul, Jim, and David Yeager will be here to answer the thoughtful questions of our wonderful moderator, Dr. Emily Gale. This day has just been a great opportunity to um, see old friends, meet new friends. I'm so grateful to everyone who agreed to participate. Uh, Dr. Emily Gale is a lecturer in popular music studies at University College Cork. Um, she's working on a book that will put it in your, in your brain and make sure you buy it. Uh, when it comes out, Sentimental Songs for Sentimental People, an unheard history of US popular music. So that's gonna be great. I'm gonna pass it over to her, but I'm just gonna make sure that um, Jim is also spotlit somewhere there. Um, Emily, it is now down to you. And Thanks so much. Conversation. Thanks so much, Alexa. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Hi, Good David. Hi, Emily. <laughs> You're well. Thank you. You are as well. I'm delighted to be here. And thanks, Alexa. That was great. Um, so good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thanks for being here. Um, I'm delighted to be joining you this evening from Cork, Ireland. Um, and I'm very sorry that I haven't been able to attend uh, the rest of the events throughout this day. Uh, all of the program looked just so wonderful. Um, but we had an open day on our campus for prospective students, so I needed to be there. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on this uh, 50th anniversary, this milestone. This is uh, very exciting, so congratulations. And to Alexa for organizing such a wonderful symposium. So I've got some questions um, for you on, um, I was directed to ask some questions about the past, uh, the present and future plans uh, of the CEE. Um, so the first question I'd like to open with is, um, and it's a big one, it's a big one to open with, but I would love to hear some of your memories um, of the Toronto experimental and electroacoustic scene, as well as any reflections on how it's evolved over the years. You're right, it is a big one. <laughs> actually, I, actually, I think uh, maybe Paul could start. Uh, He's a, he's a principal in um, Frequency Freaks, which is one of the most more interest, most interesting uh, recent, relatively recent developments, particularly around modular synth synthesis. But uh, as a DIY, as as the previous panel was describing it, uh, it, might be interesting to hear him remark on the development of that. All right, sure. Um, I thought we were going to start with history, but yeah, we can we can start with uh, with something a little more current. Um, Frequency Freaks is uh, basically uh, a monthly meetup, uh, or at least it was a monthly meetup uh, until uh, until you know the pandemic came around for us, uh, and then we went online. But the whole premise was to gather together in person. Um, share uh, our experiments, our learnings, and uh, and do little performances, educational things, um, talks on various tools, techniques, and tips, all based around hardware. Um, there have been uh, a lot of folks who have done their very first live electronic performance uh, at Frequency Freaks. Um, 
we're not picky about uh, experience or anything like that. Um, and as a result, we've had some really interesting things come through come through that. Uh, I can't remember the gentleman's last name, but his first name is Stefan. That has come up with a uh, an instrument uh, that is based on a couple of strings and some rotating magnets uh, controlled by a servo to uh, to make some wonderful drone music uh, with. Um, I had the great pleasure of mixing and mastering his first album with that instrument. That he calls the duo chord, uh, and. Um, yeah, there's some been been some really interesting developments that well. Thank you, Stephen Powell. <laughs> <laughs> um, Way to go, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so there's been lots of interesting stuff happening there. Um, but you know, on, honestly, let's uh, let's go where the question kind of started and move back into into a little bit of history. Well, we could talk a little bit about uh, the ambient ping series, which has been going on in Toronto for uh, quite a while. Yeah, um, and uh, also, uh, I'm I'm still kind of buzzing from the, the the previous panel, which I thought it was great, and really raised a whole bunch of of questions that uh, I'd uh, rather talk about. But anyway, well, <laughs> moving right along, the uh, the ping. Uh, happens in whatever space they can find. Uh, they, they've worked in clubs, they've worked in bars, they've worked uh, in uh, more conventional uh, concert spaces. This is basically the, the efforts of two guys who uh, have been uh, steadfast in producing this, these, these concerts, uh, coercing club owners into allowing them to use their space. And, um, we actually have appeared on the Ping series uh, over the last, God, I don't know, 20 years, maybe three times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave Sutherland and I made a duo appearance uh, at one point as well. Yeah, right. And uh, I've been involved, uh, both David and I have been involved in their Drone Day uh, videos over the last couple of years as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the late lamented somewhere there, which was a space, uh, 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 an, again, an, an industrial space uh, on a second on the second floor over a furniture store or a furniture warehouse, uh, again, which was basically created by uh, one guy, and I'm going to blank on his last name, Scott. Um, wonderful experimental trombone player. Uh, so the the thrust of the space was actually uh, free improvisation more than specifically electronic work. But, uh, and, and uh, Toronto has a very healthy um, free improv scene. A lot, a lot of really excellent players uh, doing some really fine work. Uh, also, that loops back to the Transac, which is another uh, venue for those for those folks. Uh, and the Transac, uh, in case you don't know, it, uh, was originally the Australia New Zealand um, Social Club, and over the over the years, it has evolved as the Australians and New Zealanders moved out to the suburbs. Uh, the the space <laughs> stayed where it was, and it has it has become much more of a, a broader community uh, based uh, activity. Great space. But wasn't Emily's original question about the the original uh, time frame that we found ourselves in, and the atmosphere that kind of was. Uh, pregnant with possibility in allowing what happened to happen. Yeah, but, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, because, you know, we already mentioned in talking about Norma B. Croft and her work with new music concerts, um, that was that was part of that same atmosphere. There was um, an appetite for a musical adventure, I dare say, in, in those days. And um, <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly what the what the ingredients were that 
created it, except that in the case of the CEE, you had you had people coming from different different beginnings and converging in an institution where one of the uh, historically most important electronic studios in North America uh, had had gone through growth and maturity and and had established tradition of, of, of certain sorts uh, and um, in meeting there under the um, should we say the protective cover of the University of Toronto Electronic Music Studio? I think those those four people uh, felt the permission to to move to the next step, which was to you know pull the gear out of the rack and and take it into the into the concert hall and and start, and start making music. Um, I know in the case of, of Norma and New Music Concerts and, and, and her partner, her, her creative partner, uh, Bobby, can, you know, they, they had had European experience, both of them, and they realized that back in what was at the time very provincial Toronto, the 1970s, um, nobody knew who Luciano Berrio was. Nobody knew who Yanis Zanakis was. Even Stockhausen was a relative unknown. And they undertook very determinedly to change that. And they, they brought these people here. Um, they brought them here not just to be tourists and observers, but to be present in, in the making of, of, of their, their works. And, um, uh, and I think that that can be a very kind of infectious atmosphere. And um, I will also credit uh, the, the, the director of the studio at the time, Gustav Schumager, for encouraging a very kind of open-minded uh, attitude and culture around the studio. And, um, you know, Gus, would bring guys like Vladimir Yusuchevsky and uh, and Bob Moog and uh, Otto Luning and and Carl Heinz and Carl Heinz himself yeah. uh, would come and and meet with 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 us quote unquote students when we were really just you know baby baby creators at the time. Uh, you know, waiting, waiting to to grow up, <laughs> waiting to learn and to grow up. So, uh, yeah, I think there was something in the air that said, uh, "We're not going to stop you. Just, just go out and do yeah. it." I think one of the things about one of the things that should be said, uh, speaking in the cont speaking about the working in an institutional context, is that. Uh, one of the things we were allowed was the permission to take, as David says, the stuff out of the studio and into the concert hall. That would not have happened in a, in a lot of other institutions. So um, Gus and um, the, the uh, technician, Dave McKenzie at the time, both of them were very supportive of our initial efforts to get out to get out of the studio. Maybe they just wanted us out of the studio. I'm not sure, but that was like <laughs> The other influence, I think that we sh we would be remiss not to mention is Udo Kosmos. Uh, Udo ran a series of concerts at the Isaacs Gallery um, just around, the, uh, just before the new music concerts started. Uh, his focus was more on uh, American uh, avant uh, composers. He brought uh, Lamont Young uh, and I think Alvin Lucier, as I recall, uh, and, and and some others that I'm probably forgetting about. But those concerts also were ex ex very important in terms of opening the, the, the window to this new work. Um, Uda was a very, uh, unfortunately he's not with us any longer, but he was a very 
very interesting, very um, um, significant uh, composer in uh, in Canadian in the development of, of Canadian cultural life. And then I dare say, uh, I guess you cannot dismiss, you cannot ignore that there was a, a unique chemistry that developed between us. We clicked, uh, we clicked real good. <laughs> as we were. And we were all pretty excited about, um, about creating in this new art form. And um, I guess we went for it with all of our might. And did, did we get anywhere near your question, Ally? Yes, I think you <laughs> did indeed. <laughs> no, thank you. That that gives such a rich context for for us, and and you know, um, yeah, a lot of kind of names in terms of musicians and composers, but also yeah, drawing a picture of the kinds of spaces, the kind of feelings um, that are you know associated with this time in in um, yeah with in the ensemble. That's great. Um, you've touched on um, some of these questions a little bit uh, in, in relationship to um, aspects of technology and the kinds of um, things that you're engaging, the idea of um, uh, moving to the concert hall, for instance, but I, I wondered if you would care to uh, reflect on over the time that you have been working in, um, in the live electronic field, um, what are some of the most exciting and most frustrating developments for you uh, in music technology? Well, um, well, let, let, let me I, I'll jump right in and say, first of all, that the the sense of your question is is really spot on because it has been the case throughout the entire history of the CEE, and I dare say other practitioners in art form that you know, whenever there has been a, a technical innovation, uh, it has spawned uh, you know, enormous amounts of, of, of music, of, of, of fresh ideas, of, of fresh approaches to, to composing and, and, and to performing. So, so uh, beneath your question lies a, a kind of like a, a reality that uh, is quite relevant to, to, to what happened. Um, so, you know, there was from 1972, there was uh, maybe a year by year procession and progression of new hardware that came on, came to us. And uh, for example, um, okay, before there were digital delays, we had the analog echo. <laughs> Remember that carning we showed this morning? Yeah. Uh, the Roland DC-10 analog echo. Well, simple device, but something that, that simply hadn't existed before. And I know personally in the, in the early 1980s, I wrote, uh, I wrote probably my most often performed piece, the uh, favor for electric viola and, and delay network and um, for Rivka Golani the violist. And it also figures prominently in the next work I wrote after that, which was Quivi Sospiri uh, for, for piano and, and synthesizers. And, um, and we, all, we all used it. And you want to know what? Um, <laughs> I've still got it in a case downstairs. It goes, it goes down the road whenever someone wants to play one of these pieces. <laughs> so, huh? uh, then there were the, uh, the Yamaha music computers. Um, then there was the, uh, the the Roland music composer. There was, uh, well, my gosh, the Roland uh, Jupiter Eight. Oh. Uh, there yeah, there's a there's a there's a phenomenon um, amongst uh, electronic musicians called gas, which is uh, gear acquisition syndrome, and it's uh, it's 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 to be resisted uh, at, <laughs> at uh, 
because it's a real threat to your pocketbook. In but fact, I I just heard um, a brilliant paper, <laughs> a brilliant paper by Samantha Bennett uh, at a popular music conference talking about and analyzing gas. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a thing. Uh, uh. I did. I have tried at various times to resist it and decided that I'm going to um, stick with the, whatever uh, setup I, that I have at the time. Uh, par partially, this is th this was generated by my first uh, exposure to a Yamaha DX7, which I still think is one of the most complex uh, synthesis presents some of the most uh, complex synthesis algorithms uh ever uh and th the notion of becoming a virtuoso uh dx7 player was uh, seemed to me for a while at least that that was something that was worth pursuing uh eventually i got gas again and it <laughs> but for a while it uh it saved me a lot of money yeah, resistance is futile <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Emily, um, I think one of the most um, fascinating projects we did, aside from you know the the operas, you know, which were great, it was wonderful to work on on all those operas. Um, and um, uh, by the way, uh, Colleen, uh, you know, in her excellent presentation, uh, she neglected to mention the Prelude in the Theater. Uh, which was a one-act opera that, that I composed on a libretto that uh, I received from Craig Fisk, who had uh, translated into English the, the, the Goethe, the prelude in the theater that precedes Faust. And uh, he did it in an English translation using only words which are in current use uh, and uh, was full of, of lyrical poetry and I, I did make an opera out of, out of that. So just duly noted, uh, Colleen. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the most fascinating projects we, were, we did was working with Stephen Gelman on the Universe Symphony. Because Steve, Steve conceived this, this large scale orchestral work without knowing really anything about the, the instruments, about the, the, the synthesizers. And basically what he did was to add to the modern symphony orchestra, you know, you have your string section, your brass section, your per percussion section, your woodwind section, and you have your synthesizer section, you know, as of, as of that piece. And, you know, he heard it clearly in his mind, but what he, what he had to do was spend, I think, a, a, an entire summer hanging out in the studio with us uh, because he called for voices that didn't exist yet. So we had to hang out with Steve and, and, and design each and every voice in this long five movement phonic work. And in the, in the course of doing this, of course, we got to know Steve really well, which was a lot of fun. And uh, he actually got another, another piece out of it. Um, he wrote a piece for uh, Jackie Parker uh, a, a piece for piano solo and 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 DX7 actually, um, and we and we designed those voices with him with him as well, but I mean that was that was an intensive period over the, the uh, you know time frame of a, of several months, where, um, you know it, it was it was the grunt work, <laughs> if you would, uh, behind the creation of, of an important symphonic and a unique, and I would dare say unrepeated uh, symphonic work um, that we, as I mentioned earlier, we, there were five productions of, of, this, uh, of this symphony. And uh, so in those five productions, I think nine performances, uh, uh, you know, for a very limited period of time, all that time that we invested in, in the creation of those voices, we, we kind of lived on that for a while. And uh, it got us around the country, it got us to work with some really fine conductors and, and some really terrific uh, orchestras. So that was, that was a very special moment among, among many moments. Wow, thanks for that.
Um, yeah, and that's actually bringing um, uh, Professor Gelman was uh, my professor at the University of Ottawa when I was doing my undergraduate degree uh, in music. And so, wow. um, yeah, that kind of brings uh, my connection to the CEE um, uh, because I would have uh, been able to hear you rehearse in studio uh, at some point between 2003 and 2005 when I was an undergraduate student. David uh, would have brought me along to a rehearsal and I was yeah reminiscing that uh, on that myself um, as I was preparing oh. for this. Great. Yeah, it was great. It was, uh, you know, I was just, a, I was a classical pianist and and didn't really know what I was doing, but it was uh, so important for me to get to have a context for Canadian experimental and electronic music. Um, I, I yeah. One, one brief anecdote about the Universe Symphony experience was our first rehearsal with, with Sir Andrew Davis, um, because Andrew wanted to spend some time with us before our first rehearsal with the orchestra. So he asked that we come to Roy Thompson Hall, bring all the gear and install the gear, work with the house technician, get the levels set up and, you know, basically install ourselves where we would, where we would be um, uh, performing with the orchestra. And then Andrew went out to the podium and he, he called out the rehearsal number and he, he brought his baton down and, you know, most conductors nowadays work with a delayed beat. You know, they show you where the beat is and then you play it. Well, <laughs> we were so keyed up, like he brought the baton down and when it, when it was down, like we nailed that beat. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, there was no delay. We just hammered the thing. Uh, we were that excited. And <laughs> we all had a good laugh about it. And then we settled down and, you know, by the time we, we met with the orchestra, we, we, we understood the protocol and where the beat. But it was a lot of fun. And the other thing Andrew said to Steve, I think Steve was, was fussing a bit over, um, over some of the, um, the solos. There were pieces riddled with, with solos, beautiful. Uh, you know, the, the flute comes out or, you know, the English horn comes out to, for a moment. And, and Steve was fussing about how they were being played and, and, and did he have to change something? And Andrew gave him a long, serious look and he said, he said Steve, it, it's not a hard piece to play. He said, it, it's long, but it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good laugh over that. That's good. So and, um, I Go just ahead, Paul. Add, Sorry. Add, a, add a little bit to that because you asked about frustrations too, not not, not just the good side of it. Um, honestly, learning how to learning how to play together uh, in an age where we can't get together in person has been extraordinarily frustrating. It's been full of ups and downs. Um, that uh, you know, we talked about our past the track stuff uh, uh work that we've done recently and you know things have improved since then in terms of being able to play together remotely but at that time it, it was not something that any of us really wanted to entertain because even the best solutions and at that time involved just way too much uh latency um so that was extremely frustrating and then of course as soon as you get a new piece of technology you have to learn about it you have to learn it and that always involves some frustration as well Yeah, I was um, I was going to ask a little bit about that, and and you have given some context in terms of you know um, uh, how to how how you were working during the pandemic, etc. So yeah, I certainly think um, many musicians and instructors share your frustration over latency during the last few years, especially. Um, yeah, I wondered um, if you could tell us, um, you've toured as an ensemble, you've, you've toured extensively over your time together. And I wondered if you would, um, if you have any favorite memories or um, memorable stories uh, that you'd like to share from touring. <laughs> well, I've got a, a number of <laughs> The best, the yeah. best one I probably can't tell you. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> uh, the silence is deafening here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I think uh, I, I think our experience with the uh, going back a ways, our our experience with uh, Super Trio as Super Trio with uh, collect, uh, with Collective Trio Collective um, was a, a very even though the tours were short. Uh, were very memorable. And then, of course, the residency in Banff, um, um, it, which involved um, interesting interactions with elk. And uh, it, 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 <laughs> but it was a, it, it was a very, it, in, a, in addition to being you know, physically uh, taxing, it was also a, a really, interesting and a very extremely intense in a good way um artistic experience working with those guys yeah yeah uh you know um the very first tour we did in 1979 you know we started in stockholm we worked our way down through copenhagen and gradually were moving southward uh, in Copenhagen, we had been sponsored by the Danish Society for Electronic Music, and they invited us to play. They had a series going in the Carlsberg Glyptotek, that's spelled G-L-Y-P-T-O-T-E-K, Glyptotek. It really was a, a conservatory. Well, it was a, what's the word, a, a, like a, a botanical garden under it. Uh, Alexa had the picture from from that that setup uh, that was in the video last night. Um, but we came in, you know, and, and so it's this huge glass dome with all these tropical plants in it. And you know, we set up and we sound checked. We went to dinner, and you know, sometimes in those big glass domes, uh, it rains. And there were, from condensation, there were drops falling on our equipment. And the Roland SH-5, when we came back from dinner, was full of water. Do you remember? We poured the water out. Uh, yeah. And I think it had about an hour and a half to dry before we had to actually play it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But it, I think it played. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I recall. Wow. Uh, uh, the uh, you know the concert uh, in uh, La Chaux de Fond uh, in Switzerland with Trio Collective Super Trio. Uh, you know, Chaux de Fond, they call it La Chaux. Uh, Chaux de Fond is uh, near the border between Switzerland and France. It's in in French Swiss Alps. And it's, you know, in Switzerland, space is always a premium. Space is, you know, there's a special circumstance in Switzerland. And this, this city is squeezed into this narrow little plane. And it's, and, and it's full of skyscrapers. I mean, they, they built all these high-rise buildings. Uh, it's, also, uh, it's also a museum town. It's full of like watch museums and uh, uh, all kinds of interesting, very narrowly focused museums. It also is the, the birthplace of, of the, the Swiss artist Le Corbusier, if you know this name. Uh, so playing at La, La, at La Chaux was, was really a fun experience. And these guys from from uh, Trio Collective had been there before. They they knew the town quite well, and they uh, you know after again after the sound check, they let us. They said, "Well, it's time for dinner," and they led us to this kind of back door that we went in, and we found ourselves in a in a dining room for um, uh, for the poor, basically for for people disadvantaged people. It was a, it was very rough seating, but you looked at the menu and you you know you said saw things like filet mignon, you know, and, and you know pretty fancy uh, offerings on the menu. So 
we all, I think we all that night all ordered the filet mignon and were served this d delicious steak. And um, I remember when we finished eating, they came around and they said, would you like another? <laughs> <laughs> this is unheard of, you know. <laughs> but uh, that, that, that's never happened again in my lifetime. Um, but we then played, uh, I think, a, a really, a really terrific concert in in, in La Chaux. and uh, yeah, it was it was a fabulous tour, um, and we played in really interesting places, for sure. Um, Incroyable. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh... I'm trying to think of where we might go um, next. I think we've got a, a, maybe a few more minutes before we open things up to um, to questions uh, from our uh, collective here. Um, uh, Paul, you've already said um, a little bit and, and given us some some context for understanding um, some of what's going on now in terms of current projects um, uh, with your conversation and discussion of frequency freaks. Are, are there other um, things that you'd like to mention that are, are going on um, currently for, for you all? Well, uh, obviously the collaboration with Exploded Ensemble at CMU has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we were there in person in 2020, which was amazing um, and, uh, and very memorable. We had a great time. The music, uh, I think, reflected that as well, um, and, as well as the performance last night. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun, too. Um, in terms of, uh, of future projects, we have our Pass the Track project. That is uh, part one anyway, which is, uh, is going to be released soon. Uh, so keep an eye on our uh, on our web page and on our Bandcamp page for that. Um, throughout the pandemic, David Sutherland and I figured out some uh, and and crossed some te technical hurdles, and we've been able to play together. And we've uh, released a couple of albums under the duo that we call uh, "Not Your Average Worker Bees," and you can find those on Bandcamp as well. Um, we uh, the CEE also has uh, three uh, albums in the can, which are retrospectives uh, that we're that we're producing uh, around the 50th anniversary. So they they cover uh, the gamut of the 50 years. Uh, all uh, all of the material has not been previously released. Uh, they've all been uh, edited. Uh, and and to a certain extent mixed and uh, I believe uh, the next step is to turn them over to Mr. Stilwell for for uh, mastering. <laughs> He's grinning. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting question. What happens next? Uh, we're we're just in terms of a performing group. We're just I think just getting our feet back under us after the pandemic. Uh, and so the, the question of what happens next is uh, it's gonna be an interesting one for all, for all of us. Yeah, as we do with everything else, we'll improvise. Uh. <laughs> that's great. And I think um, that's actually a nice moment at which we can open things up to, um, to the collective who are here. So uh, it would be, uh, great. If anyone had uh, questions, uh, the floor is open. So I think we could, um, because it's a small group, we could probably just uh, have people turn their mics on and ask questions directly, or I can read them from the chat. Or Alexa, did you have other ideas of how you want to do that? <laughs> no, that is a great procedure. There's one question in the chat, and then I'm going to throw it over to uh, Frida here in the studio. Great. Sorry, David, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just uh, saw the question in the chat, too. OK, perfect. So um, the question in the chat says, uh, what piece of equipment, synth, sequencer, et cetera, disappointed you the most when you tried to use it? You get a different answer from each of us. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I think for me, the sound canvas was a bit of a disappointment. Um, it's funny. That's what came to my mind, too, especially at first. I know, I know Larry 
really embraced it. Uh, he was really he was actually the first uh, to take it up and persuaded the rest of us to to share his enthusiasm for it. And uh, but I think most of us cooled on it, whereas he it, it, it for him it was it was a package of of sound generating modules that 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 kind of uh, it fit his his conception uh, rather well. Jim, I think you you were the other sort of longer uh, protagonist for it. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting problem because it, it again it relates back to something that was mentioned earlier in today the the quality of sound that it, that the that um, electronic instruments have produced it actually goes all the way back to to discussion with Norma um, has has steadily improved over the fifty years uh, if you listen to um, the Yamaha four four operator uh, since now um, it's it's sort of like listening to a Casio. They're not the 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 quality is just not there. The depth of sound isn't there, and to a certain extent, the the sound canvas uh, fell victim to that same progression. Uh, in my opinion, so I would say. Uh, it, what what was like of the of the equipment that disappointed me the most ultimately were those four operator uh yamaha synths um some of them which were rock mount, rack mounted like the ob1 um the ones that uh, and the four operator synths were the ones that were in, uh, installed in the cx5 uh, m music computers right so they were they were ubiquitous. You could get lots of them, um, but ultimately they didn't sound very good. Yeah, the Jupiter Eight, you know, continues to be an amazing, uh, really like a concert grand analog synthesizer, if you would. Uh, you know, you can get some of the the biggest, juiciest, fattest sounds out of that. That, that guy uh, and um, it's, it was an interesting instrument because the Jupiter 8 was a, a DCB controlled instrument. It, it was like the last instrument I think that Roland made before MIDI. And uh, the reason we have the one we have was because uh, uh, was it Peter German? Is that who we got it from? Uh, no, I think it was us. It wasn't. Wasn't it Oscars? It wasn't he using it with a with a music composer. Maybe that was it. But uh, the, that MIDI came in, uh, and so you know, basically, oh, I'm not interested in this anymore. I want a MIDI. I want some MIDI gear. Right. Yeah. Okay, we'll take uh, one more question um, here in the room with Frida. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Frida Abtan. Um, I'd like to ask you a question actually about um, the changing context for electronic music performance in Canada. So I'm a little biased because I studied music in Montreal. I'm from Ottawa, but I lived in Montreal for a really long time. And one of the right. things that I've seen over time is some of the changing trends that have uh, taken hold of the community, the electroacoustics community, but also the popular music community, and to a certain extent, the financial art support in Canada as a result. And I really do feel that Canada favors, still favors acousmatic composition on, on one side, and maybe with the emerging trend of the new interfaces for musical expression community, is finally really starting to understand a little bit more about electronic music improvisation. How do you guys feel you fit into that context? You know, have you seen um, a lot of support for the work that you're doing in different communities around Canada, specifically? We get a lot of people really liking what we do, um, asking us how we do it when they come to see us play, because uh, often we're not actually looking at each other. We're so engrossed in what we're doing. It's, it's our ears that are doing the work. Um, 
the in terms of actually fitting into the context i'm, I'm not sure we actually have or did <laughs> maybe the guys can can elaborate on things more in the past but i certainly since my uh in my time with the cee i never really felt like we fit in anywhere actually actually um you, you bring up a uh, an interesting point uh the uh, i'm not i'm not assessing blame here at all but there is there is a definite dichotomy between the way uh electroacoustic acousmatic electronic music is approached uh in quebec and and in the rest of canada um the the quebec community is is very strong produces incredibly uh incredibly good work uh but the focus uh, as you say has been much more on composition than improvisation in the area of electronic music right um maybe there's a little bit going on in the music actual community right right but that can the, uh, and in my view uh I, and that that community is much more connected to the, what uh, we in uh, the ROC say about uh, uh, call uh, free imp free improvisation, right? Um, the, uh, it's not it's not that the, uh, the <laughs> we're not dealing with the two solitudes. Uh, there are there is interconnection there is interaction uh the canadian um electroacoustic community which is a very active um um advocacy and uh um uh communication organization you know whose function is essentially advocacy and, and communication is is very active has and has members from all over canada and internationally, and this folk is, is uh, centered in Montreal. Um, the it has never, uh, having lived in this environment for a long time now, it has never particularly bothered me. It, it I'm I'm not. I think people are in in choir, uh, entitled to establish the um, the identity that they choose, and. Uh, and to uh, define themselves as they choose, uh, and so um, I can I can I am comfortable with the respectful uh, uh, recognition of difference. <laughs> well, um, just to add to that a little bit, um, I guess I would point out, for instance, that the, the nihilism, the, the nihil, the nihilist spasm band is also like. Wow, yeah, right. Band yeah. from Canada <laughs> that I would put you maybe in the same kind of general category as. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So what's in the drinking water, guys? Do you think that's a... <laughs> well, don't forget CCMC, right? Do you know them? There, yeah, yes. yeah, right, yeah. And in fact, uh, both of those organizations were started uh, by, uh, although the Anila Spasm Band was much more artists, uh, graphic artists who wanted to play music. Um, there, the there are people in the CMC, CCMC who were musicians who wanted to be graphic artists, but yes. <laughs> it does seem like there's like a kind of pro proliferation here of a kind of common aesthetic that doesn't often get talked about as a as a movement. Right, right. I yeah. would like to add though that um, the fact that we have had some really top instrumental performers. Uh, coming to to work with us uh, does underscore sort of the the performance dimension. You know, um, What's uh, just like John Farah, you know, wouldn't be playing with us. He'd be totally, you know, he'd be he'd be bored to tears if if he didn't find a uh, you know a, a, a supportive uh, context for for playing with us, and 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 
you know, Rose, who's a really fine fiddler, uh, and Rose, who, um, when, when we came to, uh, to Pittsburgh two years ago, you know, the, the signal processing she brought along for her violin was, was just stunning. And, you know, um, tradition takes, takes a different slant at, at, that, at the performance dimension. And um, so I think therein lies the, the kind of the, the aesthetic and the attitudinal difference is that um, our, our beginnings, our, our middle and our end is, is all in performance. And um, it's because we were, we were ourselves musicians. We wanted to play, we wanted to compose uh, music that, that was good, good for us to play. And um, somehow that, that tradition has been a, a constant through line. Uh, and, you know, we played with Christina petrosko Quilico, we played with Jackie Parker, we played with uh, uh, William Aid, we played with Rivka Golani. We, we've had like top flight world virtuosos asking us for works. And, um, I don't think you get that so much in the acousmatic uh, tradition. Um, I think this conversation could probably go on for a while, but um, we will we will end this session here. But it was it was very nice of you, um, David, to bring up Rose and John because obviously they're so important in this history too. Um, they couldn't participate this weekend, but we um, definitely want to make sure that they get some love. So thank you again to all the members of the CEE and to Dr. Emily Gale for moderating. Um, we are basically done here. We're just gonna move on to probably another highlight of the day. At least I'm very excited about this, that my PhD advisor agreed to give some closing remarks. Um, and I thought there was no one better to do that other than Dr. Robin Elliott, who is the Jean A. Chalmers Chair in Canadian Music at the University of Toronto and the director of the Institute for Music in Canada, one of the most prolific scholars I've ever encountered and one of the loveliest human beings. So I'm very pleased that he has joined us today um, and that he is going to provide some closing remarks. Uh, yes, my name is Robin Elliott, I'm coming to you from Toronto to Toronto, traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And I'd like to begin with um, Alexa's land acknowledgement and her encouragement to think about Indigenous issues regarding uh, music and our location. And this has been a long-standing interest of, of Alexa's, having supervised her PhD thesis. Um, I just wanted to point out to people that she was one of the first people to engage as a scholar with the work of Tanya Tagak. And she's done work since then on many different Indigenous musical artists. And this kind of crosses over into her work on the CEE as well in many ways. Uh, one which I can tell you about from my personal location right here in the Edward Johnson building is that the University of Toronto Electronic Music Studio, uh, the current director of it is Elliot Britton, who's a Manitoba Métis uh, member. So there's lots of Indigenous initiatives in electronic music, which are underway at the moment in, in uh, Canada, and I'm sure in the United States as well. So what a day, so much, so many wonderful papers, so many great presenters. I'm going to begin by apologizing for people that I don't mention by name. Uh, I'll, I'll thank you all and omnibus thank you for all the wonderful presentations and all the wonderful people who spoke today. It's a lot to process in real time and think about and try and summarize in five minutes. Um, the very first thing that Alexa said was the, the, she wanted to make it clear that the Canadian electro, uh, Electronic Ensemble were four Americans who called themselves Canadians. And that immediately got me thinking together with the title for this event, which is the CEE 50 Hybrid Symposium about boundaries, borders, genres, gatekeeping, all kinds of issues around music and the way we categorize and think about music. And one of the great things about this event and, and about Alexa's work in general, but and also about everybody's work today, is that these boundaries and borders are just thrown out the window. Uh, yes, this is an online 
event and it's an in-person event. It's about scholarship, it's about creativity, it's about performance as we've, as we've just heard David telling us. It's about composition and it's about improvisation. It's about the history, it's about the present, it's about the future. Uh, so the, the omnibus nature of this gathering and, and of this TEE's work in relation to that is just so stimulating. And I love it when scholarship gets beyond its ivory tower you know, framework and, and engages with artists, creativity, and, and performers like this. And it's, that's one of the things I found most stimulating about today. And in terms of boundaries, uh, I know the Canadian scene fairly well, but I don't know the scene in Pittsburgh. And I've really been interested to hear all of the presenters that, uh, that have told us about what all the exciting things happening in Pittsburgh, both in Carnegie Mellon and in the community as well, beyond the institutional boundaries. Speaking about individuals versus institutions, which the, the panel discussion um, with uh, moderated by Frieda with uh, Anna and Taylor and Michael, uh, there's a lot of discussion there about institutions versus individuals. And that was so interesting to think about in relation to the CEE, of course. What is the CEE? Are they individuals? Is it an institution? What is the relationship between them and institutions? They, of course, wielded incredible institutional power through, especially David. Uh, Jaeger and Larry Lake's involvement with the CBC. And I just want to reflect a little bit on Larry Lake, uh, much lamented uh, departed uh, from this life uh, eight years ago in 2013. What a wonderful person. Uh, he, he was very involved in the University of Toronto in my job. He came and basically told the Dean, you have to teach more Canadian music here. And so as a result of that, uh, I'm teaching, of course, the music in North, North America now, which is largely Larry Lake's initiative. Uh, and of course, he's the host of CBC Two New Hours program, which David produced, introduced all of Canada and beyond to incredible repertoire of music through his work with Two New Hours. So there was it's an interesting combination of influences of, of individual initiatives forming the small institution of the Canadian Electroacoustic Ensemble, and then having beyond that this bigger institutional impact through, uh, especially through, through CBC broadcasts. Um, I'm looking so much forward to Alexa's book, an orchestra at my fingertips. What a wonderful title, wonderful cover for the book. And I'm glad that we have the chance to talk a little bit about Stephen Gelman's Universe Symphony, which was my first experience hearing the CEE live. Uh, very memorable event. This was January of 1986. It was the first event of the International Year for Canadian Music. And uh, it was a very high profile event. Uh, and I get the impression that it was well received. And, and I'm interested to know from David that it it had an afterlife. In fact, I, I saw recently that it was just done in 2021, December 2021. I don't think the CEE was, CEE was involved with that performance. Uh, it was done by SMCQ. Thinking about these last 50 years more broadly, I'm just thinking what an incredible um, development and progress there has been in, in electronic music technology. Um, thinking back to my own first experiences with in this field, it was in 1975 at Queen's University in the uh, Harrison Lacane building, named partly after Hugh Lacane, the electronic music pioneer. And in the electronic music studio there, I was busy, you know, splicing tapes and, and working with tape loops and the very hands-on kind of tangible aspect to it. Um, but it was all analog. It was, and it was so, so from there to, you know, Quack Trip and Nettie McNett face, what an amazing amount of development there have been, there has been in this past 25 years. Uh, many people think of music technology as a, a young person's field, you know, keeping up with all the latest technology is difficult and hats off to the CEE for staying, not just staying abreast, but staying at the leading cutting edge of developments for these past 50 years. And another thing that a lot of people, especially in the 1970s thought about electronic music was, oh, it's something you, you know, you record, you put it on tape and nobody wants to go to a live performance of that. You just listen to it, maybe, you know, in a studio or a, on a recording. And the CEE, CEE has, 
you know, shown that it can be an exciting live performance medium as well. So that was a thinking in terms of where it started in the 1970s and, and uh, the CEEs being involved in, in the ground level in, in transforming people's perception of the possibilities of electronic music as a live music making uh, medium. It's, it's just been so stimulating to watch. So those are, those are just a few thoughts um, in terms of generalities. Again, I'm sorry for not engaging with everybody's individual presentation today. They were all so wonderful. I would like to thank Alexa for putting this whole thing and inviting me to give these brief closing comments. And I would like to thank very much everybody who spoke today, uh, the people in Pittsburgh, the CEE. Sorry that Norma Beecroft didn't end up being with us, but she does have a wonderful book we can treasure as well. It's been a great day. Um, many best wishes to everybody involved and to the CEE for the future. Thanks to everybody. That was so wonderful, Robin. Thank you so much. Um, that was such a wonderful summary. I'm not going to say anything else other than to reiterate um, some of Robin's thank yous and, and extend some of my own additional ones. Of course, again, presenters, panelists, moderators, every single person who was actively involved in this. Um, I thank you. Of course, the CEE, every member, past and current, um, thank you for your participation. The Studio for Creative Inquiry, Thank you for your work and support, especially Nika Harrison, Bill. Uh, thank you to B. Thank you to Ben Malinsky. Thank you to the students of the Music Since 1945 class, the Electronic Music Division here, the Carnegie Mellon School of Music. Um, you know, it, this is a collective effort. So thank you. Uh, go off, enjoy your day, and listen to some CE this weekend. Okay, take care.